a brand new episode of the podcast entitled Couch Potatoes Unite! Exclamation point. This is a podcast based on a blog of the same name because we hope our name will grow to strike fear into the hearts of the inner beast the world over! Also, we're not the stuff of fairy tales or legends. We're real, darn it! My name is Kylie and I love TV. If you feel the same, keep listening and or checking out the blog at couchpotatoesunite.wordpress.com as you're bound to find some common ground or something you like. For Couch Potatoes Unite, we're all about the wonders and the unique long-form storytelling of the small screen. CPU, exclamation point, hopes you've been following releases of brand new episodes of the podcast on Wednesdays, as well as new blog entries on some Tuesdays, and as always, we have several more new episodes on the way. Because the panelists and I live lives behind our podcast, the episodes are published once per week. Subscribe to the blog or the podcast via iTunes, Stitcher Radio, and via Google Play to stay on top of brand new episodes. Episodes already published discuss a variety of shows, including, but not limited to, Doctor Who, Downton Abbey, How to Get Away with Murder, Broadchurch, New Girl, Game of Thrones, Unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt, American Horror Story, Marvel Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., and The X-Files from its inception through its revival. In addition, more episodes are in the works, including revisits for The Vampire Diaries, Gotham, Supernatural, Once Upon a Time, and the DCTU panel covering the DC shows on the CW, new panels covering The 100 and Stranger Things, new series examining Gilmore Girls, including the Gilmore Girls reboot A Year in the Life and Sherlock, and because we look back at shows now past, we'll be looking back at that 70s show, Gallivant and Glee. What's more, CPU from time to time goes live. We've appeared at Comedy Outlet Mondays at Dog Story Theater and at Grand Rapids Comic Con in Grand Rapids, Michigan while streaming live on Facebook. More live appearances are being planned, so make sure you like us at our Facebook page, our Twitter, follow us at CPU Podcast, our Instagram at Couch Potatoes Unite and or our Pinterest at CPU Podcast, or subscribe to the blog, our YouTube channel, our iTunes channel, our Stitcher Radio channel, or find us on Google Play. In the meantime, if you don't hear your show in this podcast format, fellow panelists and I still write reviews and we're always seeking new panelists. So if you have any interest in joining the discussion, say hello by finding us at any one of our outlets aforementioned. At the very least, stop by and leave us a thumbs up, comment, or review. We like feedback, but don't vogue and get too feisty with us. We're sensitive types. No, really, we are. Today we're around the water cooler and recapping seasons 3, 4, and 5 of cult favorite Grimm, which has had a variable schedule over the years, but will air this coming season from January to March on NBC. Season 3 aired from October 25, 2013 to May 16, 2014. Season 4 aired from October 24, 2014 to May 15, 2015. And Season 5 aired from October 30, 2015 to May 20, 2016. Grimm is an American occult detective police procedural drama series which debuted on NBC in 2011. The show has been described as a cop drama with a twist, a dark and fantastical project about a world in which characters inspired by Grimm's fairy tales exist, although the stories and characters inspiring the show are also drawn from other sources. Homicide investigator Nick Burkhart, played by David Gentoli of the Portland Police Department, learns he's descended from a line of guardians known as Grimms, charged with keeping balance between humanity and Vesen, or mythological creatures of the world. Vesen is the German word for being or creature. Throughout the series, he must battle against an assortment of dangerous creatures with help from his Vesson friend Monroe, played by Silas Weir Mitchell, and his partner, Detective Hank Griffin, played by Russell Hornsby. Many of the episodes are loosely based on stories published by the Brothers Grimm, albeit with considerable artistic license. For example, the pilot centered around a wolf man who preyed on women who wore red. Other episodes are based on other sources, including fables and legends not published by the Brothers Grimm. When the series began, a narrator provided the following introduction. There once was a man who lived a life so strange it had to be true. Only he could see what no one else can, the darkness inside, the real monster within, and he's the one who must stop them. This is his calling. This is his duty. This is the life of a Grimm. A medium-sized but eager panel of potential Grimms and Vesson, all frequent CPU panelists, are gathered around the water cooler to catch CPU up on the supernatural procedural thriller and cult favorite, as we've not covered the show on the blog since season two. I think the panel's ready and raring to get started, so as always, it should be noted that all of our panelists have viewed the entire series through season five and may discuss sensitive plot points. For those of you who haven't watched any of Grimm and plan to catch up at some point, particularly as it's entering its final 
final season, listen at your own risk as there are going to be major spoilers. At this time, I'm going to have the panel introduce themselves. If you follow our podcast and our blog, you know the drill. I'm going to ask each panelist to identify themselves by their first name, only their first name. They're going to tell us how they came to watch Graham, how they found out about it, what made them start watching, what kept them watching, and then I'm going to ask them to rate their interest in the show. This is the CPU standard character question. Of course, that question changes with each show we cover. Are you ready, panel? Yes. Yes. All right. So how would you rate your interest in this little show we like to call Grimm? Do you watch it because you truly love this show and the identity of a Grimm? For you, it's more than loving this show. Grimm is life because you are a Grimm or want to be a Grimm, like Nick Burkhart. Do you watch it because your significant other watches it and because you love the world of Grimm and of Vesson, most likely because you're already part of that world yourself, like Rosalie Calvert? Do you watch it because your partner watches it and you're loyal to your partner, and or because it's thrilling for you to be a part of the secret supernatural hunter circle, to know the specific secret Grimm language, to recognize signs of voguing, and to make a real difference with sources of evil and unrest you could never make sense of before, like Hank Griffin? Do you watch it because your best friend watches it, and or because you particularly enjoy it? In fact, you're a geek for the show's deeply historical, mythological aspects, a fiction proprietary to this show that has been derived from actual history and from the grim fairy tales themselves, like Monroe. Do you watch it but are not sure if you like it? You watch it as a matter of professional interest, even though parts of it are deeply personal to you. You respect what the show is trying to achieve, but can't completely enjoy it all because it hits a little too close to home for you and or because your life has been rougher than most, like Captain Sean Renard. Do you watch it bemusedly? You think it's somewhat boring because weird things happen all around you, so you feel like it's all been done before, repeatedly, like Sergeant Andrew Wu. Do you watch it, but you've got complicated feelings about it? Sometimes you love it, sometimes you hate it, because you've learned somehow to be afraid of Grimm or were recommended to stay away from Grimm. In fact, Grimm might be a guilty pleasure for you, like Adeline Shade, or you don't watch it anymore or don't like it or don't like it anymore because, spoiler, you became a Hexen Beast, and then, in order to deal with your new life as Vesson, you subverted your former personality to control your power and your emotions, including your prior love for the Grimm, like Juliet Silverton, a.k.a. Eve. Who would like to start? I'll start. Okay. Hi, I'm Kristen. Hi, Kristen. Hi. I started watching Grimm the day it premiered. I saw the ads on NBC when it was coming up, and if you listen to the Once Upon a Time podcast, you know that I love anything and everything fairy tale, especially when they have a new little twist. So I knew I was going to love it off the bat, and I have proudly watched Grimm live as it has premiered through the years, and I have no signs of stopping. My interest in the show... Also, if you listen to other podcasts, you know I usually don't just choose one. I usually choose <laughs> ten of them. So She keeps saying that because she's on. Most I'm of on most of them. <laughs> <laughs> I would say I truly love the show because I'm like Nick. I love the world of Grimm like Rosalie. <laughs> I, I I just love it. So I'm, I'm like Monroe, too, because I like the, the mythological stuff they've set up. And I think that's where I'm going to stop. I'm going to say I'm like Nick, Rosalie, Monroe, three. I've limited it to three. <laughs> I think I'm good. Are you sure? No. Okay. <laughs> I mean, you, I, you could pick the whole list if it really I could, lost your vote. I could pick the whole list, but I'm going to stick with the three, Nick, Rosalia, and Monroe. All right. Fair enough. Welcome back, Kristen. Thank you. I'm Nick, not Burkhardt. <laughs> Hi, Nick, not Burkhardt. Oh. Nick is on most of our other panels as well. <laughs> the silver medalist. <laughs> it's kind of true. <laughs> I started watching the show within five episodes of it, Aaron, because I kept up on with their website, on the, the NBC website, because I love I love the Brothers Grimm. I own multiple books about their stories. Not that they actually wrote them, but they kind of wrote their versions down. So I've kind of always been into different fairy tales and things like that, and I really enjoyed the show the first two seasons, and I kind of dropped off for a while. But when I picked it back up and caught up again, I liked season three through five a little bit more. I liked the first two seasons more the second time I watched them, too. And I would rate my interest. 
I will follow the rules. <laughs> hey. <laughs> and I will be Monroe because I particularly enjoy. In fact, I'm a geek for the show. It was deeply historical and mythological. Myth- uh, shouldn't have decided to read it. <laughs> Monroe. Serves you right Doug, for following the rules. <laughs> Well, welcome back, Nick. And you, since they're on panels together so much, they might get feisty like this. Yeah. <laughs> Nick's kind of like an unofficial brother. I can just say that. Yeah. Hi, I'm Jen. Hi, Jen. On that note. <laughs> I don't know how many follow it, right? right? I am like Kristen. I started watching it since premiere. I saw an ad on it just back when we had cable. I saw an ad, and I'm a big fan of the Brothers Grimm and fairy tales and all of that. And I was like, I have to watch this show. And I was like hooked from that very first episode. I mean, it just gets better after you know season one, two. Not that those two seasons were bad; they were good. But three, four, and five got so much better. And I'm like kind of like him. The second time around, watching three and four and five, I liked even more than I did originally, which is, I don't know, that's weird, right? But I would have to say that I am probably Nick the most, but some room. Okay. Welcome back, Jen. You probably heard Jen's voice on a few other panels if you like this genre. She was on the Supernatural panel, for example, as is Nick. (laughs) Yeah. And as I said in the intro, my name is Kylie, and of course I'm moderating today, but I'll also be participating. I started watching Grimm because if you know me or you follow the blog or you've listened to our podcast, you know that as somebody who keeps their eye on the TV industry, I look to see what's coming out in the fall, and I became aware that Grimm was coming out in the same season, ironically, as Once Upon a Time, which Mm -hmm. I'm sure we'll talk about because we also podcast about Once Upon a Time. If it's fantasy or fairy tale or even kind of mixing that with horror, which Grimm does, I will most assuredly watch it. It's just a hands-down thing. It's my favorite genre, that and science fiction. So I knew I was going to watch it. I was a little bit leery of the procedural portion just because I don't typically like procedural TV, but wanted to give it a shot. I also, I don't know if I would say I was hooked, but I definitely liked it a lot when I first started watching it. And I have kept up with it over the years. There's been a little bit of a, you know, kind of up and down lapse and watching it live or watching it at least within a stone's throw when it originally aired, but I have always kept up with it. As for my interest in the show, particularly now after having watched five seasons and being at the end of season five, uh, at the time of recording, the sixth season premiere aired the night before we meet. <laughs> I know, and hopefully nobody's watched it and will spoil it today. <laughs> But since I am at the end of season five and having have been through the journey of Grimm so far, I watch it because I truly love this show and the identity of a Grimm. And it's more than loving the show. Grimm is life because it's like Nick Burkhart. I was so, I mean, Jen is right. It's just gotten better and better and better as the seasons have gone on. Five is really the creme de la creme. I'm totally hooked. I think it's better than Once Upon a Time right now. We'll probably talk about that in both podcast, but definitely enjoying Grimm, and can't wait to talk about it. And as I mentioned in the intro today, we are covering three seasons. This is going to be a long one. I was writing on, when this was just a blog, Couch Potato Night was just a blog, I was writing about Grimm because I liked it so much, but I haven't done that since season two. While I was trying to make a podcast, I took a break from some things. So, at this point, we're now going to talk about three seasons. We're going to cover seasons three, four, and five. And we're going to ask you to think back first, and then we'll work up to season five. We'll probably hit more of seasons four and five, just because I feel like more happened in those seasons than it did in season three. But we're going to cover season three as well. So, let's start talking about it and just to kind of refresh both the panelists and the listeners' memories. Think back, if you will, to the third season of Grimm. This was when we first met the royals in a really significant way for the very first time. If you recall, the way this season started is there were zombies, zombie Vessen, <laughs> descending upon Portland, and they got Nick in the season finale, and then... It cut, and then it premiered to a zombie Nick. But the whole season was really about the royals getting pretty militant about 
the Grimm, and then a resistance to the royals springing up to kind of combat them. Tell me, what did you think of season three, this particular season, and what did you like about it, what didn't you like about it? And of course, if you follow the podcast, you know that I send out talking points, so we'll talk about some of the larger points and if there are any individual stories, because Grimm is a little bit different than a normal fantasy show. It's told halfway in a serial format and halfway in an episodic format. So some episodes will cover a larger story that spans the season, and other episodes might mention that story, but then not really do much else with it and just focus on a monster of the week, kind of like the X-Files used to do. So, what did you think of season three? It's not one of your talking points, and maybe I'm remembering wrong, but is this the first season where we really have Rosalie is on board and she's a cast member? Because I don't, she wasn't, she was in scattered episodes. She went and saw her, her sick aunt for a while, too. I know season one. I don't even know if we meet her. Yeah, she's in season one. We meet her in season one. She's not a regular in season one, but I'm not sure if season two or three was when she was made a regular. I think it was season two because I know she kind of came on board when her brother who owned the tea shop was killed. Right. And so then it kind of from that point she was kind of... a smattering, so we didn't know if we were going to keep her or they were going to... Yeah, I think she became... I think... She became a regular in season two, or at least became more common in season two. I feel like she was a regular in season two, but we'll research that. Mm-hmm. Okay, I guess it doesn't matter that much. One of the things, I like that character a lot, and I liked having her around more often. So season three, that is definitely in full swing with their storyline. So I wasn't sure where that started. That's kind of why I wanted to start there. Okay. Because I like Rosalie. I, I like too. Rosalie, too. Well, season three, is that's when Monroe and Rosalie... That's really start. Yeah, they really, really get together. Yeah. Yeah. That's, Especially since Which I like. I do too. I like, yeah, I, like I like them. Their initial cast of the show only had one female and she like doesn't know about what's going on. And yeah, is that kind is of, not actually that popular. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Juliet was boring in yes. the first couple seasons. I mean, she didn't really have a personality and yeah, mm-hmm. season three is kind of when it started to, to shift, when they started giving yeah. her more to do. But obviously, as we're going to talk about seasons four and five, I think that's when her personality really came through. And season five, they really gave her mm-hmm. stuff to do, which is when I really started to like yeah. her a lot more. Well, I think her personality emerged in season three, but it was as more of a, she was whiny and complaining yeah. kind of type, only because... In season three, she ends up finding out that Nick is a Grimm mm-hmm. and what that means to their relationship and to the danger that they keep finding themselves in. Because if you notice, a lot of stuff comes breaking down their door. Like, it mm-hmm. invades their home space, and there's a lot of questions that get raised. And, I mean, for a time, I think, in season three, they're not even really together, or they're just estranged but living in the same house and she still can't remember him or is that all season two i think <sighs> season, I think two. season two okay. yeah. yeah yeah she remembers him but the revelation of the grim stuff just That's freaks it. her out yeah <laughs> I, she feels maybe awkward at, like how how is she processing all this that right. you know exactly. and how does she fit into this yeah world? how does she fit in she wants to fit in she wants to you know, yeah, because she still she still wants to be with Nick. Yeah. She you know they were going to be getting engaged at one point earlier, yeah. and you know she finds the engagement ring and all that. So she obviously really wants to be with Nick, but the revelation, oh man, you've got some crazy mm-hmm. stuff happening. How do I fit in, and can we make this work and move forward? And also, Nick was getting a lot of because we meet in season two. We meet Kelly Burkhart. We find out Nick for the longest time. If you followed the show. You know this, believes that his parents are dead, and then he learns that his mother, who is actually also a Grimm, is alive and is played by Mary Elizabeth Mastrantonio. You know, they we meet her for the first time in season two, and Kelly tells Juliet, you know, you may not be able to be with him because this is his life. This is what it looks like. And they even have a conversation in the third season over email because Mm -hmm. in order for Juliet to make sense of everything, she starts communicating with Kelly. I feel like whether he's actively being a Grimm or not, Vesson would notice he was a Grimm and still come after him. Mm -hmm. So I, I feel like he truly doesn't have a choice until the 
this is not season three, I don't think, where he does kind of have a choice. That's at the end of season it's, four. Yeah, at the end, end of season beginning three. Beginning of season four. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, because when, I mean, kind of jumping ahead a little bit, but this ties in with Juliet, you know, when Nick does lose his grimness towards the middle to end of season three, you know, Juliet's a big fan. Hey, you're not a grim anymore. We can go have a normal life, and this is going to be great. And so, you know, Nick agrees to give it the old college try and try to be life not being a grim. And, and then dot, dot, dot. Dot, 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 dot yeah. Four. Yeah, <laughs> then we get it well. You know, part of it is then, you know, Juliet comes around once an evil Nazi Vessen That's group. season four. Sorry. Season three. Oh, <laughs> zombies. Fine. Yes. Fine. Okay, so the zombies. We're starting with zombies. We're going to start fine. The zombies. <laughs> Come back a few. <laughs> Oh, okay, well then fine. I'm going to segue into my thoughts about the zombies. Okay. <laughs> because we get zombie Nick the Grim, and then he does some zombie sort of things, and then they just let it go. Yes. Like they had like the supersonic hearing and all that crazy stuff. But it and then it's through. It's in very, season four. Is it? But they, and even in season five. I think Maybe it's a little, but the, the, the hearing for the, the hearing thing. time. The hearing yeah. thing has always been a thing, though. Yeah. Right. What but she's saying is the zombie stuff went on gray. overdrive. Yeah. He turns the gray in season four. Mm-hmm. And I even think he does not at the beginning of season five. Does he? Because well, I just feel like they, it's they did that pain. and they just let it go. I do remember yeah, because that it's kind when of he, doing it like oh, That's once. season five. Yeah. But it is. I just watched it this morning. That's why I remember. But it is. It's just the one I feel. You? You're right. It kind of just, it was really faint. I did not mm. notice I didn't any notice of it either. Like I thought it was an abandoned yeah. thing, too. Yeah. I will tell you when we get to that point. <laughs> you don't want me talking okay. about season five. No, not yet. <laughs> <laughs> season three, though. When he became a zombie, I was like, how is this going to affect him? Like, I was, that was the moment where I was like, okay. I'm hooked, really hooked, invested in this show now. I, I was before, kind of, but, like, that, it was just, it was the first time we saw Nick put into real harm's way, kind mm-hmm. of, and a bad guy for a little bit there. And, you know, even though it didn't last for very long, which I kind of, it should have lasted a little bit longer, oh, Yeah, I think. Really? I do. I do. Just so I could go, what's he going to be himself again? Yeah, it just, I don't know about, maybe not lasted longer, but resolved better. But then Jen's yeah. saying that maybe it was meant to be not resolved better. And it's keep continued. But I've not noticed that at all. Yeah, I didn't. I, 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 I vaguely didn't. remember it kind of, I remember it happening in an episode, and I thought it was leading up, oh, so this is what will happen in the next episode. Like, but later. they drop it. Yeah. So yeah. they totally drop Even it. when they yeah. bring it up again. It's then they drop ju- it. It's, they, it's for a minute, and then they're yeah. gone. Yeah. yeah, exactly. It's almost, well, maybe. So I wonder if they're trying to say what's to come. Or there's just too much going yeah. on. Yeah. 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 If, I mean, if they're planting seeds in other seasons, which we'll talk about when we get there, <laughs> it'll be interesting because, obviously, there's six seasons, only 13 episodes, and they've got some big chunks, and if this is somehow continued, because that was going to be one of my complaints, too, about season three. Like, this was a fairly... And season three, to me, is probably the most problematic season of the five, mm-hmm. just because it starts off this way, and it kind of... And I don't say problematic like I hated it. I still enjoyed it, but, you know, between seasons one and two, which were kind of laying the mythology, season three was really the one where they didn't have to spend so much time on exposition. And it starts with this zombie motif, and it really just feels like, and we're done. And that's all mm-hmm. there is to yeah. it. And it was fairly intriguing when it started, but then it just felt anticlimactic by the time it was done. And I was like, well, that was a lame season transition. It may, may have put me off watching it for a little while, too. I mean, I came back to it, of course. But. Yeah. It's like, I feel like out of all the seasons, season three is where it starts to get a little muddled. Like Kylie had said, you know, they set up the mythology and the way that the show is probably going to be going in seasons one and two. And then three, they just throw all this stuff at you. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I think since season three, they're making an effort to get back to that. But, yeah, three was not as strong, I think, as the other ones in that mythology sense. I think it's funny that it took three years to find out how the Vessin can tell Nix a grin. Yeah, yeah, I thought that too. I'm like, it, was all, it almost felt weird. Like, oh, he just has to put sunglasses on? Right. Oh, know. for... Because yeah. they yeah. can see it in his yeah. eyes. Yeah. But I, I kind of like it because it almost, like, they turn jet black and that horror movies has taught us that that's not a good thing. <laughs> right. Yeah. So it's, it's true. Yeah. 
I feel like it should have been in like season one. <laughs> yeah. Like Probably, the first yeah. couple of episodes. Yeah. Like, how can that, yeah. Hey, no, I guess he wasn't really great friends with Monroe that quick, was he in season one? No. It not took right. a while. So it, it took, took a, a little while. while. Yeah, they were kind of reluctant friends at so first. That's and how he finds out with yeah. them. So I don't mind it. I mind the timing of it for two reasons. Because it was literally again jumping basically to the end. An excuse to get him to go to the wedding. Uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Like, I would have felt better about it if they had explained it, even at the beginning of the season three, so that, oh, this is what he can do, Mm -hmm. so that he can go to the wedding. So the wedding that we're referring to is, in fact, Monroe's and Rosalie's, because in season three, they go from being kind of dating, to moving in together, to getting engaged, to getting married. They, they, They have a rapid progression in season three, romantically. So how'd you feel about that? Liked it? Yeah, I did too. It felt natural because they were they became really good friends and you could see the the signs of interest between the two of them in season two. I think the writers and the actors themselves set it up really well, where even though season three was a very quick progression, it felt natural. It didn't feel forced. It felt like, you know, they had everything set up and it just laid the groundwork for them to continue. And it almost felt like they had been together for three years. Yeah. Because yeah. they, they yeah. basically hit it off pretty well. They have good from, chemistry. They do. They have very good chemistry. It's important to mention this and to mention this wedding because one of the related aspects of season three that also bridges into season four is that there's apparently a stigma (laughs) that comes with different types of Vesson intermingling, if you will. In fact, there's a group, which we'll get to in season four because I don't think it's named in season three, Mm -hmm. that... Basically, it's almost like purebloods versus muggles in Harry Potter, where only Vesson of one kind can marry Vesson of the same kind. So if you're a blute button, which is what Monroe is, basically a wolf creature, you have to marry other blute button. And it, Rosalie is what's called a foopspaw, which mm-hmm. I think is a fox, basically. Yeah. Mm-hmm. She's so cute. Yeah. <laughs> she is cute. A vixen. Yes, mm-hmm. a vixen. They aren't supposed to go together, according to most Vesson. And this became a huge plot arc for their characters in season three and four. What did you think about that? I liked it. It (laughs) seemed natural, Hmm. but it also... I don't know how different each type of Vesson is. Like... What do you mean? Nick's battled so many. Nick as in Burkhart. (laughs) (laughs) If Monroe and Rosalie had a kid, I just am curious about that. Well, that if question will be addressed <laughs> shortly. Yes. <laughs> mm-hmm. But Spoiler. because he's battled so many, there hasn't been like a half Bowerstein, half Mole thing, whatever those guys, Beaver, Ice Beaver. Mm-hmm. It, I, I didn't feel like that came out of nowhere. It seemed like a natural storyline because we've seen all these basically, I guess, pure blood Vessin. In their families, it's always been a Bowerstein with the Bowerstein mm-hmm. and then... Mm-hmm. Bud and his whole family are the ice beavers, and I love Bud, just a side note yeah. there. Oh, you know, but yeah, it's, it's just, funny. there's been no intermingling. I mean, they can be friends with each other, no problem, but it, it's the marrying and reproducing that I this group has a problem Sean with. Sean is Bernard, how you say it, is that right? Yeah. Yeah. He's, he's, he's half. half. He's, he's half. He's the only half. one that we know is not half. Yeah, yeah he's half. Half half and half. Okay. And yeah. I don't, so they do consider uh, X and Beasts Vessin, but they're like, you can't take a potion and become a blue button. You can't get cursed and become any other type of essence. So that one even seems different than the rest of them. Yeah, well, Hex and Beast, she, they kind of play by different rules. Yeah, and Zabber Beast, which is the male version. Yeah, That's right. what Sean is. Yeah. I almost don't consider that a thing. And that was frowned upon. It was more because it was the royal line. But, yeah, yeah. Because but, his father was one of the royals, and that was bad news bears. But that's the one where I don't know how you could be half, like he, which I guess only parts of his face. That's what yeah. 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 And he doesn't really have any magical ability. Whereas if he were pure blood, he would be. Because the hex and beast, zabber beasts are basically witches. Mm-hmm. Yeah. This world's version of witches, and he would have magical ability if he was pure blood, quote unquote. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I guess that's the best way to say it. Yeah. Yeah, so I like the storyline. It comes naturally, and I like how they handle it as well. But I don't think they resolve it until the next season. They don't. Mm -hmm. It just gets introduced. Because the wedding is basically overturned by this Mm -hmm. strife. Well, and part of it, too, part of the reason the wedding gets overturned is because Trouble trouble. was introduced in season three. Who's Trouble? Who's Trouble? 
Teresa Rubel. Mm -hmm. Trubel. No. Yeah, that's how it's spelled. Yeah, no. but, yeah. Trouble. It's spelled trouble. Jacqueline Taboni, who is from Michigan, mm -hmm. she oh, goes or went. She went to the to U of M. To U of M. She was discovered there because one of the producers, and I don't remember which one, they gave a talk to her acting class or her writing class or. And he's something. from Michigan. Yeah, or or is related to somebody from Michigan or something. There's a connection as to why he went to U U of M to get this talk. So they give this talk and, and do some scene work, some line reading, and decide that she's like... Awesome. Yeah, a find, a, a rare talent. Mm -hmm. And her, and uh, it should also be noted that Grimm is co-produced by Sean Hayes, better known as Jack from Will and Grace. He was also there, and they all basically mm -hmm. conferred and flew her back to Portland, where they filmed, because mm -hmm. this is really filmed in Portland, mm -hmm. and made her a part of the show. Mm -hmm. So who is Trouble? Trouble is another Grimm. When Nick loses his grimness, Trouble shows up in a town. It's very Confused. Buffy the Vampire Slayer. <laughs> when the Slayer is gone, new Slayers come around. Yes, Nick, it looks like you want to say something. Okay, first of all, one of my problems with the show is how many frickin' Vessin are in this town? Or is this what it's like everywhere? This There just seems to be a lot of Vessin. That's an excellent question. A lot of different question. types. Yeah. I know! <laughs> And, and even the really rare ones end up in Portland. And yes, there's no, yeah, yeah. And there's not even like, oh, well, the Hellmouth, that's why. But it <laughs> yeah. just... Well, but I can't... They do say, it's Portland. <laughs> it's Portland. But also, I mean, this Buffy analogy isn't far off base. David Greenwald is one of the executive producers, and yeah. he was one of the executive producers on both Buffy and Angel. Mm -hmm. So the fact that you can draw ready comparisons and think of Portland like a Helma, because the way I suspend disbelief there is basically people are attracted to a Grimm. It's kind of a weird symbiosis, mm -hmm. the best in people, I should say. Now, I don't know why they're like so half the population is Vessin. <laughs> But that's that's how I explain it in my brain. And then we also get the I think back peddling of an explanation that men become get their abilities later in life is why Nick didn't know he was a Grim but Trouble did earlier. They kind of mentioned Well that. it was the reason though that Grim got his powers later in life is because his Aunt Marie was the Grim, the one who raised him. So if she you're was, born a Grim, you're a Grim. Right, but because she was the main Grim in the family, because his mother was assumed dead. But not actually dead. So. When, once Aunt Marie started to die in season one, when she came to visit him in the opening, that's when Nick started to, his power started to manifest themselves, because that generation's Grim was dying, so then it passed to the next generation. I do think it goes by generation, mm -hmm. because there is, at first I was confused, and I thought, well, maybe... Like the Slayer, the Grim is the chosen one, but it's I don't think that's it. There's multiple Grim alive, but I think yeah, it's generational. It's different yeah. it's different family bloodlines of Grimms. And the, so there's Nick's, Nick's mom the, didn't die. No. No. And she was still grimming it up even when <laughs> yeah. Nick had his powers. Right. So I I just don't think that's something that that uh, the show That could be an, an inconsistency. It's, yeah, it yeah. could be. They have a few. There yeah. are some yeah. continuity yeah. issues yeah. in the show. Yeah. I just think that's kind of a big one when the show is called Grimm. They kind of, <laughs> their Bible should have had some right. sort of... Well, maybe the, and that's more of a season five thing, but maybe a discovery that's made in the season five will help us to explain some of these inconsistencies, mm -hmm. Intent. I don't know, they've already filmed the season six, so we'll see, but... But getting back to Trouble, so that's kind of where we were Trouble. going. So she's obviously from another line of Grimm's, so we are led to believe... I don't think it's been confirmed if they're related in any way besides having a common grand I, ancestor. I think they did say it. I He's thought not maybe not this season, but I think they're later. Well, Nick later. says maybe. When she says, are we related? When he says, says maybe yeah. because... Like, because it's a genetic thing. Yeah, if you inherit your grim ability. If they're all descended from the brothers Grimm, which I think we're supposed to believe. I don't think they're... Are they descended from the Brothers Grimm? Yeah, yeah, that's the so. point. That's well, why they're called Grimm's. The whole, well, yeah. the Brothers Grimm are descended from the Knights Templar, we find out later. Spoiler. Mm -hmm. So, so I mean, how far back do they really go? Yeah. <laughs> well, I don't know. Yeah, we don't know. But, I think that's yeah. what we're going to find out. Yeah, so Trouble comes to town. She's this, literally, she's a troubled kid who grew up kind of in the foster system. She starts Trouble. She, she is She trouble. is Trouble, which is why they have that lovely name. She cannot reconcile her grimness. Yeah, she thinks that there was something psychologically wrong with her until she meets Nick. And this is at the point where I think Nick's grimness is gone, and so he takes trouble 
under his wing. She temporarily moves in with him and Juliet for a while, and he starts training her in the ways to be a Grimm. I know she's a suspect in a homicide investigation for a little bit, and that's kind of how they figure out she's a Grimm. But at the wedding that we've mentioned, the, one of the reasons it all goes to hell after everybody's accepted it is the fact that she runs in with some news for the Scooby gang, if you will, and everybody and all the Vessen see her dark, dark eyes and freak out, and the wedding goes muck. That's how the season ends. Right? That yep. is how yep. the season ends. Yep. But other stuff happens. Other, Other stuff, stuff yeah. happens, and we, we should mention the royals, because really the, the biggest sort of global arc of season three was the fact that the royals were stepping up their efforts, and it's going to be interesting to see how the royals play into what happens later, because I'm not even exactly sure, but the royals in this season, we actually meet Prince Victor, who's played by Alexis Denisoff, who's better known as Wesley Wyndham Price from Buffy and Angel, <laughs> yet another parallel to draw, not, sorry David Greenwald, you did it, anyway, he's on there, he is a cousin to Sean Renard, because of course Sean is halfway related to the royals, and the half-blood prince, it's half-blood prince, yep. that's what he is. Essentially, there's this, Sean kills somebody <laughs> in season two, and I don't even remember who it is, but Victor... He kills the other prince. The other prince, The yeah. other cousin. So Victor wants revenge, essentially. In the meantime, Adeline, we should mention Adeline, yeah. you know, she lost her powers in season two, thanks to Nick, because yep. she's a Hexen beast, the female yes. version of which. And she goes to Europe and gets cozy with the royals, basically because she's trying to get her powers back. But in the meantime, she sleeps with Sean <laughs> mm -hmm. and gets pregnant with a child. Well, she sleeps with his brother, too. She does. Yeah. She sleeps. She but gets she, she wants to be I think under she's the royal's had, protection. She yes, she does. Royal I think she's bedded everybody but Wu and Hank. Well, and, but her mother was the same <laughs> way. It's part of the Hex and Beast MO. They are oh, very right. beautiful. I suppose you're right. They, that's, you know, it's very much like the evil queen in Snow White. They're very vain. They're obsessed with beauty and power, and they do what needs to be done, or who needs to be done. Yes. So, yeah, she's, she's doing that kind of thing. And she gets pregnant, and she has this child, whom she names Diana, after her own mother, who Nick's mother killed in season two. <laughs> mm -hmm. But she, at this point, still thinks Nick did it? I think she yeah, actually thinks yeah. that, yeah. So what about that storyline? Because that storyline carries through. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, and the royals, is it in season three that they end up kidnapping Diana? Or is that part of four? Oh, that might be That's part of four, four because okay. in season three she has the kid, and yeah. then the resistance, led by Meisner, mm -hmm. tries to essentially funnel her out of the country because she realizes that the royals want to take Diana away from her. Mm -hmm. And she wants to keep, you know, she her mother instinct comes on, turns mm -hmm. on like a switch apparently, yeah. and she wants to protect this child, and so she sides with the resistance and meanwhile, Kelly Burkhardt is working with the resistance as well. Mm -hmm. So by the end of the season, Kelly ends up taking, at, or Diana. taking Diana to protect Diana from, from the royals who are going to use her as some sort of a weapon or... Exactly. Yeah. So it's Early on in season three that Adeline gets her powers back and then she gets pregnant? No, she's pregnant when she gets her powers yes. back. She's pregnant when she gets mm -hmm. her powers back. Okay. Yeah. She, needs she had to go through that whole She had to go through the, the ritual yeah. of get, getting another hex and beast spirit to inhabit her body, essentially. Right, yeah. With a gypsy played by Shora Agadashlu, who's been on a lot of stuff, too. Yeah, she was, nature. she was good. Stuff. Yeah. I can't, I can't remember her character name, but... Mm -hmm. That's her real name. So what about all of that? Any thoughts? I liked it. Part of my issue with Grimm, I like the show a lot. I'll probably be watching the show again. As opposed to other shows with Monsters of the Week, sometimes this one gets, like, another one. What is this? Like, how many different Vessen are they? Why are they all here? Sometimes I can't buy into that, and sometimes I can't. The second time I watched season one or two is why I liked it more, and I, for whatever reason, mm -hmm. was able to not mind. But this storyline helps get away from that a little yeah. bit. Yeah. Like, I think the story arc is more entertaining and grim to some extent. And we've kind of, I think seasons one and two also tease the royals so much that mm -hmm. it's nice to actually find out more about it. And, and what their purpose is in this mm -hmm. greater mythology of Grimm versus Vesson. Yeah, so overall I like it in general. I agree. I like the mythology portion of the show. 
it was really the second half of season three that I was kind of like, okay, I really kind of like you were saying, Jen, but I had a later revelation about it, and it was because of this storyline and the fact that Kelly came back and how everybody's mixed up in it and, you know, what are these royals really after and what is what is this child? <laughs> Why? <laughs> Why are they after? They know yeah. well, something. I think it's because she's really powerful. Like, yeah, she has, that's what we I mean, there was, yeah, there was all well, the crazy stuff. Well, we know that stuff. now, but they were only hinting at well, it before. Well, it was her, like the Adeline's pregnancy, like funny things were happening. Yeah, like, that's when she, true. She, when she didn't you know, have her powers. Yeah, before the, she got her powers back. Yeah, yeah before she, she got, got her powers back, she had that's right. secondary powers through mm-hmm. the baby. There was the weird skull thing on her stomach but then once the baby was born at the end of season three like her eyes were violet purple she was making things levitate and move around like infant yeah like she's this crazy powerful child who has royal blood which is another reason why the royals want her that's right like william from x-files except that's alien blood true there's probably some X Files people working on this because Portland's not far from Vancouver. <laughs> <laughs> so if you like Buffy, X Files, or Harry Potter, there's lots of different things. There's yeah. lots of yeah. If basically, you're a genre nerd. This is your show. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. So my question about this baby is: so the father is Sean, which is Zauer Beast, mm-hmm. yeah, right? Half, which Half. is the male version of a, of a hex and beast. beast. Yeah. So the. It, this is just a hex and beast baby, right? Wouldn't it be? Well, it's, just, it's it so because she was pregnant special. with her during that. Oh, when she went to get her powers, her powers back. back. Yeah. I think oh, that's so I, it yeah, made the that baby even sense. more powerful. I, 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 I can't figure out what weakness. made her eyes purple. Like what? It's just because she's that powerful. Yeah, of a baby. that makes sense. Yeah, because I think because royal one. blood has a certain thing potency. potency with it, yeah. and then the fact that. Adeline had her powers, lost her powers, regained her powers. That had something to do with it too. So she's like uber hex and beast. Got it. Makes sense now. That's good. That it makes sense. Because <laughs> <laughs> uh, I remember thinking at the time, "What is going on?" But no, that does kind of line it up mm-hmm. pretty well. Any thoughts on any of the isolated stories in season three? That season we had water vests in, we had an exorcism, we had an evil Santa, we had a, a healer who actually hurt people, <laughs> we had a scalping cop killer vest in, uh, the sideshow where Monroe and Rosalie went undercover. Yeah, that was a good one. Mm-hmm. I like the evil Santa one. The Krampus. The Krampus, Krampus. yeah. Yep. I, don't know, I think season three was kind of fun with their Monsters of the Week because I think this is when they really started to branch out and not just use the characters from Grimm stories. Because like in seasons one and two, they would have, you know, Red Riding Hood story was essentially the premiere. They had a Cinderella version early on. In season three, they started to get into more of the folk tales and the lore and the mytholo- you know, mythological creatures. And those got almost predictable. Like, well, it's Cinderella, but something's got to be different. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. And they were neatly wrapped up. They were often than not. Yeah. So, for sure. I actually, the one-offs or the Monsters of the Week or the episodic tales, they're interesting. Some some are better than others. Sometimes they're flat-out boring to me. I don't really remember the ones in season three as much, just because it's been a while since I've watched them, but... I don't remember anything that I liked better than the overall arc stuff. The royals and particularly Adeline's baby was probably the most interesting storyline to me. I should mention to you that, or we should mention to the listener, that Zuri pops up for the first Mm -hmm. time in season three. And that becomes important later. Mm -hmm. So if you recall, and I don't know if this is because he was broken in real life, but Russell Hornsby, who plays Hank... He was on crutches for half that season because mm-hmm. he had an injury, and then Zuri came in playing a physical therapist. So I don't know if he really knew physical therapy. If you remember his last episode before he goes on vacation, and he's not in a couple episodes, uh-huh. he's standing for like half a second. Someone pushes him into a chair, and they wheel him out of the office to go on vacation, uh-huh. and then he's not there. Uh-huh. And then he comes back, and Hank was injured. So I think my guess is yes he was injured for real Mm -hmm. okay so that he wasn't injured on the show for as long they gave him some time off to heal and they didn't say when it happened initially but that in rewatching, that's almost that episode it's almost comedically like trying to hide a pregnancy yeah (laughs) 
So it's important to mention this Zuri person because she comes in as his physical therapist and they hit it off. You know, he's attracted to her. Hank has a real pattern with <laughs> women who don't treat him well. But anyway. Ellen. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. He, he did with Adam Adam for a while. Did they have sex too? Yep. Wow, yep. gee, she's yep. been with everybody but Wu then. So. <laughs> okay, that may change. Oh, well, that may be even, that's true. Anyway, this is important to know only because of all of the women that he sees over the course of the show, this one kind of stuck for a while, except we find out that A, she's Vesson, and B, she finds out that Nick is a Grim and then basically heads for the hills <laughs> mm-hmm. and leaves him in the dust and he's wrecked, emotionally wrecked. Any thoughts about that? I liked her, but I kind of hated that. I wanted her to come back sooner, I guess. I get, I kind of get why she left, but I didn't feel like it was enough to stay away for good. Like, I thought she saw enough of that he was a good Grim. Mm-hmm. To not be that afraid. Yeah, and their chemistry together too was really, really mm-hmm. nice to watch. Indeed, yeah. she's been on other things too. Sharon Leal, she's, but I can't think of what it is. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Should, I up? <laughs> should, we, should we go to the magical Google machine if you'd like? <laughs> While you're doing that, are there any other thoughts about season three before we transition to season four? Was season three? Is that where Wu gets? I think that's season four. Well, it's in, was it in season three that he got attacked oh, by that blue with the... Vessen, the one who like comes over him in his bed at night and he yeah, starts seeing things? Yeah, he yeah. sees Ashwang. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yes, the Ashwang. Thank Ashwang. you. He sees Voguing for the first time yeah. in season three. He, but it's not crazy. he goes crazy. He, he goes starts crazy. Eating, he starts eating his couch. Yes, he does eat his couch. Yeah, that was no. They're very that character. He said, that was in two. He, that was, was when he was, two? but he ate Hank's cookie for Adam. Oh, yeah, oh, that's, that's right. right. Oh, that's right. That's in two. He did go crazy. He did go crazy. I think that's in three. He goes into an asylum. Because in four is when he... Because he discovers the Grim book in Nick's house with the picture of the Ashwang yes. in it, and he thinks that's right. how it's from Aunt Marie. That's when he yeah. starts to go, okay. Yeah, that's when he starts to wow. figure it out. Maybe well, because he he's also sees a Vogue. He, put, yes. yeah. he puts two and two together. Like, yeah, that, that he like isn't crazy. And they yeah. actually, Why didn't they just tell him? Between Nick, Hank, and I know, Sean, right? They should have told him <laughs> They had so many earlier. Earlier. He's, he's, he's there them. for every single case. Well, and in season three, the way they kind of prolong this is they have Juliet of all people sit him down and say yeah you know crazy things happen and this happened to me and Nick and you know you're gonna be okay everything's gonna be okay and it's mm-hmm. like ah uh, no why don't you just I mean, bring him in just fold. bring him in yeah. fold. Yeah. everybody else was I in by that so bad for him I yeah. Mean, yeah. yeah. I know, but Boo's also one of my favorite characters because he has yeah. these little sassy one-liners. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's like he's the sassy cop. I love it. He's, and it seems like a yeah. really long time where he kind of knows, but they don't know. Like, he knows mm-hmm. something's up. And yeah, like, he can... He's. It makes the other characters seem stupid. Like, they don't realize what he's saying. So that, I think, was annoying to me. Yeah. I wanted them to just tell him. Me too. And then they kind of... Mm-hmm. I agree had a Scooby gang like in Buffy with everyone working together. Also, Monroe's at like every single crime scene, so... Right. That's true. He's they should just, Yeah, they should just give him that status. They keep calling him in. Yeah. yeah. With Sean's full knowledge. Yeah. <laughs> so, mm-hmm. yeah. We call Monroe. Oh, okay. <laughs> what is... No, I was trying to... He said, like, what does Monroe have to say about this? In a couple episodes. Yeah, yeah so he does. Kind of. <laughs> of course, they do establish that Monroe is the most historically keyed in to the mm-hmm. Grimm and Vesson mythology, if you will, which is what makes him kind of a fun character. He, Monroe's my favorite. Yeah, yeah he's yeah, awesome. He's, he's written really well, mm-hmm. too. I would say Nick and Monroe are my two... Well, Nick, Monroe, and Rosalie are yeah, my favorite. Yeah, top three. Yeah. I completely agree with that. Mm-hmm. Any other thoughts about season three before we transition? No, let's go. All right. Yeah, season four. Woo! Season four. So... After all of this stuff, as we mentioned earlier, what ends up happening is Kelly takes Diana, Adeline's baby girl, Adeline and Sean's baby girl, and hides her with the resistance because the royals want her. So in the meantime, maybe you can refresh Kristen since you mm-hmm. seem to be fresher on the plot details. <laughs> Nick loses his grim abilities, I think thanks to Adeline. It right? is. It's mm-hmm. because of Adeline. Adeline, she now has her... Hex and Beast powers back. This happens at the very end of season three. Yes. In order to kind of get revenge on Nick, 
because she's still angry that, you know, he took away her Hex and Beast powers at the end of Season 2. Still thinks he killed her mom. Still thinks, yeah. And then, you know, the Resistance is now taking her baby, all that good stuff. She... She was a ball of anger, that one. She, yes. And as a result of this ball of anger, she goes into her mother's storage unit where the rest of her possessions were placed after she passed away. That's so was nice. beheaded, you know, <laughs> whatever. I'm trying to make it nice. And she finds this spell book, this heavy duty spell book that is can only be opened with blood. So it's very dark, dark Hexen magic. Yeah, Hexen. Yep. Yep. Only Hexen. Yep. Mm-hmm. She opens the book and she finds a spell on how to turn into somebody else temporarily. If you like Harry Potter, it's very much polyjuice potion. It is very uh, polyjuice potion. It's really the sorting hat. Yeah, it's a polyjuice potion. With a sorting hat! Yeah. Yeah. With, the, with the witch's hat. So she devises a plan to become Juliet temporarily. She calls like Juliet's office to find out when she's going to be in the office so she can sneak into Nick and Juliet's house. She steals hair from a hairbrush and some of Juliet's clothes. She steals the sexy little negligee. And she conducts the spell twice. The first time she does it, she experiments with how long it's going to last and how convincing she can be. And she goes to Renard as Juliet. Yeah. And he very much believes her. And so she's like, hey, I can make this happen. So Adeline goes back to the storage shed. She mixes up the second batch of this potion, which she has to inhale the smoke of the potion through, through the, the sorting hat, hat, through the sorting hat, mm-hmm. and she becomes Juliet on the day of Nick and Rosalie's wedding. Monroe and Rosalie. Sorry, thank you, Monroe and Rosalie. She goes to Nick on the day of Monroe and Rosalie's wedding, as you know, he and Juliet were supposedly getting ready to go to this wedding. So, as disguised as Juliet, she sleeps with Nick to take away his grim powers, which is successful. Which is very successful, and that's kind of how that whole thing happens. So as we start season four, Nick doesn't have his grim abilities. Adeline has had this happen, and a seed was planted. (laughs) And (laughs) we'll say it better later. (laughs) And then in the meantime, because Nick doesn't have his abilities, trouble is being the grim of the moment. And... Also, Monroe and Rosalie are still dealing with, we learn, there is kind of a KKK or Nazi-like organization mm-hmm. among Vessen called the Vessenrein that's all about this pure blood stuff and not intermingling. And they're really, you know, harassing them and cracking down on them to the point where they actually kidnap Monroe at some point. Mm-hmm. Now, we'll transition this, because there's another aspect of this season, which occupies the entire second half but we'll get to that in a minute so what do you think about season four what did you like what didn't you like let's talk about it i mean overall it was just a more entertaining season i agree Mm -hmm. i like we're starting to get like the group of them working together more and Mm -hmm. i really like that i don't scooby gang though it is yeah i love it as well yeah Yeah, and juliet was fully brought in to be part of the scooby gang woo was part of the Scooby gang now. Eventually. Yeah. He get, he's finally told in season four, yeah. over a couple of episodes, they make a big deal out of yeah. it because he's the last one. He is. <laughs> so. But they bring him along when they go to rescue Monroe. They do. I can't remember when. Is that later in the season when they rescue Monroe? It is. They start with... Sort of middle of the season. Yeah, because the first thing that happens in season four is the Vessenrein, is that how they yep. say it? They leave, essentially, a burning... Wolf trap, they said. Yeah, right? it's a burning wolf trap on. Kind of like a burning oh, cross. Yeah. Kind of like a burning cross on <laughs> yeah. Monroe and Rosalie's front. This yard. is not subtle commentary. <laughs> folks. No, it's not subtle. No, in the least. Yeah. So this is their. And this is before the United States presidential <laughs> election. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah. So that should I just go into it? Yes. Go into okay. It. So but you have to set it up. I have a story. Yep. Yeah, I'm setting it up. Okay. So because I got it confused in the talking points. <laughs> so. So there's so much. Adeline there's starts so much shit. I, she yeah. does. She's a shit stirrer. Mm-hmm. That one. So the Vess and Ryan, when they're alerted to Monroe and Rosalie's wedding and that they're together after their honeymoon, when they come home, they have a burning wolf trap, whatever yeah, it's what called. It was. It looked like a wolf trap. I don't know. I don't know. I don't remember. Whatever that symbol is, you can Google it, listeners. It um, like a big stick on fire. Yeah, they lit it on fire in their front <laughs> lawn. It was very <laughs> unclear, but there was definitely something on fire Where, in, in their front, front lawn. lawn. <laughs> and it was very, yeah, very evil. And Juliet has been the biggest... Clearly evocative of things. Thank you. Yes. Juliet, throughout this whole time when Nick was no longer a grim 
when he lost his power, she was very adamant. You are this is good for us. Like I, you know, we can get married. Yeah, we can, we have can kids. We, yep. we can, yeah, and but it was at that point where she realized that two of her very good friends were in danger because she's best friends with Rosalie for a very long time. By this point, she is the one who says, "All right, Nick, we got to get your powers back." And I think that's the end of one of the first episodes of season four. And so that's a big turning point for Juliet as a character. She's like, yep, nope, you have to get back here because we need to save our friends. We need to keep them safe. And he's relieved by this because he, he was really struggling with the normalcy aspect. There's really a, an implication in this season, and it comes through Nick, that you can't really separate yourself from being mm-hmm. a Grimm. Once you've seen it, you can't go back. Especially when he's right. a cop. Exactly. Like, yeah. You really see it there. Like, he and really it helps him as mm-hmm. a cop. Yeah. And it helps him and Hank as detectives to know when things are vested and when, when they're not. not. So the procedure that has to happen for Nick to get his powers back essentially is a reverse of what Adeline did, where Adeline, taking the polyjuice potion to become Juliet, now... Sniff it through the sorting hat. Sniff it through the sorting hat. Mm-hmm. Now Juliet has to become Adeline. They have to reverse the spell, essentially. So Juliet's game, she knows, you know, it's going to be a little uncomfortable, but she as posing as Adeline, has to sleep with Nick. And somewhere along the line, (laughs) in the spell, when she becomes Adeline, one of the side effects is that, spoiler, Juliet becomes a Hexen Beast. And because Hexen Beasts are born, like you have to be born a Hexen Beast, you know, they're pretty powerful when you're just born a Hexen Beast. But when a non-Vessen, a person with no Vessen blood whatsoever, purely mortal, when Juliet is made into a Hexen Beast... She is one of the most powerful Hexen Beasts the world has ever seen. And that sets a ton of shit up for season four. It does. Which I just gotta say, I like. (laughs) Me too! This is what I started to like, Juliet! Yes! Yes. She has something to do! do. do. Yeah, it gives her something. It gives her meaning. Like, not that she wasn't... First, I feel bad for her because she's had a lot of crap done to Mm -hmm. her by that Adeline. But that's actually a positive. Yeah, well, and for her too, part of the the Hexen Beast spirit, if you will, that inhabits her, because it's always the Hexen Beast is a spirit being, the one who inhabits Juliet really latches onto her anger and makes her extremely angry at Adeline for everything that she's put her and Nick through. And, you know, I mean, Adeline has been a problem for them since day one when Nick became a Grimm. She's the reason his aunt had died and... Mm -hmm. It's all, it's all Adeline's fault. And Juliet hates Adeline with a passion. And she starts trying to find ways to kill her, hurt her. She just really manifests that anger in a very negative way. So basically the third quarter of the season is all about Juliet trying to adjust to being a Hexen Beast. She's still... She's getting a little feisty with everybody, but most of it is turned toward Adeline. At some point, however, she realizes that she cannot keep back all of the anger and that she is enjoying the power because, Mm -hmm. as Kristen mentioned earlier, that's one of the motivating forces for Hexen Beasts is that they love power. And she actually makes a comment about, what if I'm doing this wrong? What if Mm -hmm. I embrace it rather than trying to control it Mm -hmm. or Yeah, because she she goes and seeks help from another powerful Hexen Beast to try to learn about... Mm -hmm her powers. She works with Rosalie for a while. And then shit starts to happen (laughs) in major ways. So what do you think about all of this? Because again, this carries over too. I liked this storyline for the same reasons that Kristen and Jen said, but I wish it kind of took a turn. I guess I wanted her, she could still struggle and we can still watch her dealing with it, but I wanted her to stay, like, as part of the gang and work with them more, Mm -hmm. it definitely does not go that way. Not in four. Not in four, right. Not in four. Well, and in part of that, Juliet goes to Sean, too, and reveals herself to him, and he kind of has a hand in that, too. She wants to... And they have Hanky Panky. I was going to say, doesn't she have sex with him? Yes, she does. And because... Well, should we mention... We should probably go back and talk about the consequences of Adeline posing as Juliet sleeping with Nick. We haven't talked about that yet. Go that's for a, it. Okay. Adeline gets pregnant. Spoiler. Real excited to say it. Real excited to say it. <laughs> Adeline gets pregnant. Again. This she's, time yeah, by Nick. This time by Nick. She's real fertile. When she's pre- <laughs> yeah, when she's pretending to be Juliet, she finds out she's pregnant. In real life, the actress was pregnant, so they wrote it into the show. Claire Coffee. Yeah, Claire Coffee. Thank you. And when Juliet discovers this, that's when, that's when she really gets angry, and that's when she really starts going after Adeline is... 
you're having the life with Nick that I've always wanted. You know, Nick is protecting Adeline because it is his baby. You know, more people are coming after them. So he's reluctant about it. He's reluctant. He doesn't know what to do. Yeah, but it's, you know, he's he becomes a more chivalrous guy like he is, and he starts trying to protect her and protect the baby, and especially from Juliet and her anger. Half grim, half hex and beast, though. Is the baby for sure half grim know. and half hex and beast? We don't know. know and that's more of a season five question, mm-hmm. but... <laughs> yeah, so throughout season four, <laughs> Adeline is pregnant, and they're trying to protect her from everything. I still really liked this season because what they were trying to do, and I think they did successfully, I know you're saying, Nick, that they could have had her struggle longer, we could have watched that more, but I think what they set up and executed pretty effectively, and it became the engine on that season, because if that hadn't happened, I don't know how I would have felt about season four, Mm -hmm. because I really liked season four because of the storyline. They basically flipped Juliet and Adeline on their heads, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and not by choice of the two characters. It was completely out of their control. They were two characters that always hated each other, as Kristen said, and they finally had to see had it out, but also had had to see things through the other's eyes because they were playing the role that the other one had been playing up until this point. And I thought that was a really interesting choice, and that they did it very very well. And it you could see it because all of the supporting characters played out how they felt about it as well. The Scooby Gang of Grimm, if Mm -hmm. you will. So, for me, I really enjoyed that. I thought, wow, season four was really good. And well, it was the first time I was like, I love this show, as opposed to, I like this show. It's yeah. good. Well, and NBC was, I mean, the writers and the network and everybody was doing a good job of, like, getting that tension between Juliet and Adeline to really rise every week. And then they started teasing, I think it was called, like, Beast Fight, I think is what the hashtag was, since that oh, started to become yeah, a thing. Yeah. yeah, so teasing, teasing the two going head-to-head was a big, big moment in season four. Epic, magical... Showdown. Showdown. I guess it's more the season five storyline with Juliet that this led into that I didn't like as much. Okay, fair enough. Because I agreed with everything you just said about it. And I think I was just blurring it into... It does tend to blur. Mm -hmm. Because there were still Monsters of the Week in season four. There were still Monsters of the Week in season five. But I almost feel like for the first time, and maybe that's why I liked these two seasons the best, those Monsters of the Week episodes were less than... They were. The mythology Mm -hmm. ones. And the mythology ones are the ones that probably interest me more. For example, in season four, here are some of the Monsters of the Week in season four. There is an octopus-headed vessin that steals memories, Mm -hmm. a rabbi's golem, which apparently Mm -hmm. is a vessin. That's weird. (laughs) (laughs) Mm-hmm. The Chupacabra in a recycling from an X-Files episode. So is Rabbi's Golem, too. And that's true. You're right. <laughs> Lord. A new take on the Lucky Rabbit's foot, which was actually quite disturbing. There was a Vessin who had a Pushing Daisies curse, where if he touched mm-hmm. somebody, they died instantly. And another one who froze its victims. And then there was the American Indian Power Quest, where the tribe, if you will, hailed from Michigan. Is that one Hank? Got that spirit in him? Yes. That's mm-hmm. where it had like a rabbit head or something? Not a rabbit head. A jackalope. A jackalope. Yeah. 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 Jackalope. Yes, yeah. that was that thing. one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And there was another one where we get to see a, sort of this rite of passage for Blue Button that Monroe ends up playing some undercover work. Mm-hmm. So... There were less of them, I feel like, but they were better quality because there were only a few of those, mm-hmm. and they concentrated on the Juliet, Adeline, and Monroe and Rosalie with their intermingling best and species mm-hmm. story. Jen, what do you feel about season four? Season four is when I said, I really, really love this show. <laughs> Just mm-hmm. because all the crap that Adeline has, or not Adeline, yeah. Juliet has taken from Adeline, at this point... They're on, when she becomes a hex and beast, they're on like this level playing ground and she can actually fight her without dying. Good she point. in fact almost kills Adam, mm-hmm. but, which I was like, yay! <laughs> <laughs> which is where you said she, she didn't five, die? I changed my thoughts oh, on okay. everything. So. <laughs> but Fair yeah, enough. the yeah. show did its job there. <laughs> yeah, I really liked it. Yeah, season four was definitely mm-hmm. one of my favorites overall, especially towards the end of the season. I didn't think that this show could really 
shock me in like in a really strong way and they surprised me and they shocked me by Juliet taking her anger out on Nick and the Scooby and by torching Aunt Marie's, Marie's jar and all the I was so weapons. disappointed I, I, my jaw literally dropped and I just I sat there watching like holy shit like, they just they evil. did that. I mean there is no coming back from right? this trailer that was you know their fortress the of solitude was so cool yeah, yeah. I mean, it pissed me off, but they did. And they show something on fire, like all the X Files. It yeah. looks as devastating as you would think it would look. And then they like, well, this is what we were able to salvage. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, well, you kind of salvaged a lot more than. <laughs> but you they know, really didn't salvage plot. a lot. They, they didn't salvage the trailer. They just films. turned the trailer into a Monroe's or the Spice Shop's basement. That's they did, but there was. And then I they got think... more books that were yeah. more ancient. Well, that was later. I don't yeah. think that they, I mean, I don't think they saved as much. They had fragments of pages and yeah. Yeah. torched I don't think metal. they should have. I'm mad that I don't think they should have torched it. Like, they shouldn't have wrote that. Especially Juliet doing it, but just in general. that. Well, I think it's because of the fact that it was Juliet who torched the trailer and not some random Vestin of the Week or evil Adeline. The fact that it was Juliet made it all the more mm-hmm. worse. Because mm-hmm. she knows there. how important I it know. is. I <laughs> know. It definitely hit you in the gut. Because that's where all the cool mythology stuff happens. That's where they read the books and you learn about the Vesa. And the weapons are there, the potions are there. the And all everything. the stuff that you hope are going to help him. But in, I hated watching it burn, but in many ways it also made the show extremely exciting because they had to be much more creative about how they dealt with their problems. It's just the lost history. I know. Yeah. <laughs> I know, Nick. Nick, who's not Nick Burkhart. I know. <laughs> I feel like there are a lot of little story arcs. What about the, the Royals? The Kenneth. Is he yes, the Kenneth. Because Wesley Wyndham Price mysteriously disappears, <laughs> mm-hmm. where the heck did he go? That's what I want to know. This is another. This is my no. main. No, he, he wasn't. wasn't. He just. Not that they mentioned, I don't, I don't remember. Think he, no, I think I the think king just said he wanted somebody else. Yeah, he was somehow was, not. Yeah. Did it. He wasn't happy with his progress or something. And maybe Alexis Denisov got another project, but that maybe. was a major yeah. story mm-hmm. blunder and my main complaint on the season. Like, what? What? Who? Yeah. Uh, Where did he go? Yeah. And then Juliet sleeps with this, Kenna, in yeah. her bed, which I think was a dig at Nick. Really yeah, it's well, supposed yeah. to be. I think <laughs> because her <laughs> anger shifts. She's, yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. when he starts protecting Adeline, she's no longer just mad at Adeline. She's, she's also mad, at mad at Nick. But he's choosing her. But she doesn't get pregnant. If that was Adeline, Adeline would go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe Adeline's... she's got a problem. <laughs> I think Maybe Adeline's sad. like extra fertile and Juliet's infertile. That's Poor sad. <laughs> Is it though? She's a hacks and beast at this point. <laughs> we don't want her to procreate. No. We'll find out what that means <laughs> later on. <laughs> so. Ooh. Spring Hill Jack. That was the season, right? What? Oh, Spring yeah. Hill Jack. Spring Hill Jack. Renard is a Jack the Riddler. Riddler. Oh, yeah. Yes. Yes. And it ended up being Sean, right? Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Because he brought back something from that his mom saved his life because mm-hmm. he died. He died. And his mother sacrificed sac- herself. Yeah. that snake on his chest and. <laughs> Yeah, yeah sucked out her life force and yeah. gave it to him. Because yeah. she's the hex and beast of the equation. Yeah. That's mm-hmm. where he inherited A powerful his, one, apparently. Yeah. I don't... What is his father? Do we ever find we don't, out? We don't know what the no. royals are. We know... We, I don't think that's been... Even in season five, I don't but think But his they father would have to be, like, the king's brother or somewhere he, along His that father right. was, like, a prince or... He was some ra- higher yeah. ranking royal. He wasn't the king of the royals, but he was up there. But yeah, we don't know what the royals are. We don't know what kind of vestin they are. Like his dad's a scar type, if this was the Lion King. Right? I guess so. Maybe. Maybe. At that level. Because the other people we meet of the royals before we meet the king are like his half-brothers, right? Or cousins? Cousins. Most of them cousins. are cousins except one was a half-brother. Yeah. Wesley Wyndham Price and Kenneth are both cousins of his. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And they're the direct descendants Wesley of the king. Wesley Wyndham Price is, by the way, his Buffy name. The character name is Victor. Yeah. <laughs> so... I'm Grim. So Kenneth probably stop saying that. Kenneth is Sean's, Sean's cousin, cousin and Victor's cousin. cousin. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Whatever. I don't need the family tree. I guess. Yeah. It's a little. To understand. Yeah. <laughs> Are you just giving up or what? Yeah. <laughs> I want to know because I want to know. Well, I, mean, I guess I'm saying I don't think we have it. Well, no, I, we don't. 
I, they have not explained the royals. They, they have. All. They've kept them pretty mysterious. Shrouded. They're always yeah. in Vienna, but what are what is he the king of? The Vessen. Yeah, they're the ruling family of. But the they're Vessen. not Vessen. We don't know. We don't know. It never know. comes out. Never came out. Because if they're Vessen, one... wouldn't Renard be not half human? He would be half whatever the Vessen of that royal family line is. I don't know because we that is so it, confusing. Yeah, they they have just they never said what kind of vessel they are. They're some sort of vessel, or I don't know, or maybe they just had the vessel, but they're not vessel. Sometimes yeah. after these conversations, I don't know if I like a show. <laughs> <laughs> well, hopefully that will get resolved in season six. That's hope. So. That's one thing. A, lot, a lot of the fans are like, "Well, who are these people?" Like. Mm-hmm. We know that they're especially royal, because we doing? haven't really addressed them since season four, which we'll get to in season five. But yeah. that's a very good question because we, they have never explained that, and they have never explained. They haven't stuck around long enough to. Yeah, they haven't. They've they really just been an out. ominous force that wants to kidnap <laughs> Adeline's kid, basically. Yeah. Or threaten yep. Sean from afar. Yep. It's kill the Grim, save the royal baby, continue our quest for world domination. Yeah, world domination. So they're the brain. They want to take over the world. Yeah. <laughs> Which show doesn't this parallel the Grimm? <laughs> side note on Grimm. Okay. okay. Uh, in general. Is it the same? Side note on Grimm. Grimm is the topic. Okay. Uh, from the seasons. <laughs> okay. The whole Grimm. Any animal that exists is a Vessen, too? That's what it seems like, right? Well, there's octopuses, so there's a Vessen version of an octopus. Right? There seems to be Vessen equivalents, but I yeah. think there are still animals. Yeah, that are not they're not. Human. They're not related. No, I know. But every species that exists, it seems like whenever the writers want to pick one, that yeah, that existed all along. Yes. Okay. Mm-hmm. So there is a little bit of that. I, want, I won't deny it. I want like a raptor vessel. You want a dinosaur? Sure. Okay. We had, they had lizard ones. We had lizard ones. That's kind of I think as close as we're yeah. going to get. We've had lizards and birds. And Dinosaurs are extinct. Yeah. Get over it. But well, maybe they're vessel, aren't? <laughs> We don't uh, know. Okay, well, go on. Maybe we'll find out. No, Who knows? Don't. 13 episodes. So, <laughs> <laughs> can, can we positively <laughs> make that work hard? <laughs> With season four, can we talk about Chavez? Please? Oh, yes. oh yeah. She's, she's, yeah. Season, yeah. she's yeah. out of the season. She got released from prison and now works for the FBI. <laughs> That's true. Yeah, because true. she's on Orange is the New Black. <laughs> she's Elena, Daya's mom. But on this show, she's Chavez, and she's a Vessen working for the federal government. And she starts a whole bunch of mess at the end of the season. I guess overall I wanted more of that character. We kind of meet her, and then it's a while we, before we she comes back, and then, then she we... dies. That's, it feels like well, I wanted more of her. happens in the fifth season. Yeah. Right, but I don't think she did that much in between. Well, like, except I feel like when Trouble tells, tells Nick about her, it was she... like, you should have said that months ago. She was gone for a while, wasn't she? That's true. She was introduced, and then she was like, yeah, gone and trouble for go- several. Chavez was introduced and leaves. Also, trouble goes in and out. Yeah. yeah. Because I don't think they have the money to keep that actress on the whole time, basically. I think they just shuffle her off, and she's either helping people or... Well, remember, for a while, she was helping the descendant. Of, he was on the East Coast. I think his name was Josh, where oh, like yeah. some, some vessel went after his aging father who was a Grimm but, he but Josh oh, yeah, didn't yeah. inherit the Grimm yeah. gene. But he had a key. But he had, he had one of the keys because now we're starting to get back into the original mythology with the keys and the coins and the black forest. They bring it stuff. back and yeah. wrap it up real quick. They do. I don't think it's wrapped up. But. No. but yeah, so Trouble was off with him for a while helping him hide out and going through all of his dad's stuff which then she brings back to Portland to replenish the lack of trailer, I think. That's season five though. Sorry, the keys, Sorry. right? The season yeah. 5 okay. is the keys. Yeah. Season four I'll say what, what I meant wrapped about. up real quick with the keys. Yeah. When we get to there. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yes. That was but yeah, so fun. that's why Trouble isn't always in season 4. She's off helping Josh. And then Chavez comes in and tries to recruit her. Right. She tries to kidnap her and tries to recruit her for the organization that she really works for. And she really kind of does this with everybody, but she starts with Trouble. Because she's a grim. And because she's young, I think. Well, I think yeah. she would have done it with Nick, but he wasn't she, a grim. He wasn't she a checked. grim at the point. Right, yeah. exactly. She's some sort of bird, right? Yeah, yeah. she's yeah. like a hawk. <laughs> she's a hawk. She's some sort of bird. <laughs> yeah. But what happens at the end of the season, and now it gets really, really feisty at the end of this season because not only do we have Juliet going full on Hex and Beast, she burns Aunt Marie's trailer, doesn't she? She comes to kill Nick. 
She basically is yeah, all yeah. set to, you know, go full on hex and beast yeah. against the so called Grimm in their home. Trouble bursts in. Trouble kills Juliet. Mm-hmm. That's all we think. Yeah, yeah. She shoots her with a bunch of arrows to keep her from killing Nick. Also, Juliet takes out Kelly Burkhart. Mm-hmm. Decapitation. Decapitates Decapitation. her and steals back Diana, Adeline's child, with And Sean. she gives Diana back to the royals. She does. All of that happens in that last couple of episodes of season four. Well, that and also this, the other kind of, Nick started to talk about it and then he kind of, we got, we got sidetracked. So this other kind of random story arc that happens is that there is a serial killer in Portland, which they put two and two together and realize is copying Jack the Ripper, so they think. Except that it's not copying Jack the Ripper. Twist. Somehow, and maybe Kristen remembers how, or Jen remembers how, Sean is inhabited by the spirit of Jack the Ripper, who is a Vesson. Is well, that what we're supposed to do? I don't know. It was something with, I don't know if he was when he, when he, he died, died, he died, and when his mom did the snake-to-snake snake heart thing, when Sean essentially came back from wherever he was, spiritually, oh, right. Jack the, the, Ripper the spirit hitched a ride. Hitched a ride. Yeah. Yes. And then Sean plays the part of, well, he basically has, he has some alien abduction missing time episodes in this where season. Where he has blacked out. Yeah, he and he has out. some phantom bleeding where sores open up on and him and he has no idea where, the, yeah, yeah, all this stuff. And what we find out is that he is essentially being driven by Jack the Ripper and then not remembering it when it happens. So what did you think about this entire ball of stuff? I think the actor. <laughs> I think we're coming back out. <laughs> he did a good job with it because mm-hmm. when they Sasha show, was. yeah, yeah. So when they show him killing or whatever, I thought it was a totally different person. Like I didn't even guess it was him until they started dropping clues. Like for him to change his voice and out, I mean, he just he's a good actor. Mm-hmm. He is a very good. actor. I actually enjoy the Sean character for the most part, just be, and also he's kind of handsome. Mm-hmm. Which helps. Which helps. <laughs> Although I like David Gentoli more. Oh, for yeah. The record. <laughs> I think that's why. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm Because you want to marry him. No. He's engaged to Bitsy Tullock, who plays Juliet in real yeah. life. Oh, really? That's how yeah. Yeah. That's so cute. Nick, Nick Burkhart, in real life, actor, is engaged to Juliet's Actress in real life. Because oh, yeah. they have good chemistry. Yeah. On they do. Screen, and that's, so. yeah, that's how they met. Yeah. Well, super cute. Some... Her character might be two dimensional, but they have good chemistry. They do, yeah. <laughs> I like the challenges that they gave to Sean's character in season four because when they when he was essentially maybe or maybe not dead at the very end of season three when he was shot outside of Nick's house, they did that because they weren't sure if the actor was going to come back for season four. He, his oh, contract wow. was still in negotiations, and so. They left the door open where they could close off the Sean character if he wasn't going to come back for season well, four really or keep oh, it yeah. open for him to return. And so the way that, okay, yeah, hey, Sasha is coming back for season four. Great. But now, well, now we need to really give him something to do to stretch his character. Well, and did. so that's <laughs> how, yeah, and well, that's how the whole season four Sean arc came oh, to be is because okay. they really needed to give him more meat to his character. Well, that's interesting. And actually makes me forgive it a little bit because I did not like the Jack the Ripper reveal Mm -hmm. only because I thought well that was just so left field like what (laughs) and why do we care about it in comparison to all this other stuff that's happening like I know Jack the Ripper is a subject of fascination you know his identity as yet is unknown he'll always be stories will always be made about Jack the Ripper but I just felt like it was really out of place in Grimm Mm -hmm. And I didn't like that. That was my yeah, least was favorite kind of part of yeah, season weird, four. weird episode. I mean, I liked the episode, but it was weird that they put it up there all of a sudden. Yeah, I couldn't decide how I felt about it. It seemed so different. Separate. Disjointed? Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 That's how, And that's what I perceived. Like, it doesn't... It's not... It's kind of like an interesting ghost story. They've told... Other TV shows have addressed spirits hitching rides into resurrections before but mm-hmm. it, it's also a nice little add-on to yeah you probably shouldn't if someone's near death bring them back like once the show introduces the possibility of bringing people back from the dead then when you kill someone off or you're not sure if they're going to die it doesn't have that heightened oh no 
which I guess they did with uh, Juliet too. So it's nice that there are consequences from mm-hmm. it, just like when they killed Buffy, there were consequences of that. Yeah. So I like that there were consequences. That consequence did seem somewhat separate and like a tangent from the show. And not necessarily a good one. Mm-hmm. Which isn't to say that Sasha yes. didn't do a good job. But, but he kills the... Spring Hill Jack kills the Hex and Beast that was kind of trying to help Juliet, yeah. right? Yes. yes. That's how she meets her end. I yeah. wouldn't mind more of her, actually, but... I know, I was kind of interested. That's, that I was think a that's part of why. Star. Yeah, that's yeah. kind of part of why I also didn't like the storyline, because I wanted to see more of her, mm-hmm. maybe even trying to help Juliet as she gets over her, her rage for Nick. And I just felt like if they were going to do that, they should. They didn't do a very good job of spreading it out over the season. It was kind of something they vaguely mentioned, but then it really picked up steam at like a certain point that dovetailed this whole hex and beast melee. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, and by the way, twist. There is a part of it that I like that <laughs> there are some crimes that aren't technically Besson related. Like, at first you think it's just a serial killer in Portland, but that wasn't really a big aspect of it. Because well, no. right now, from our point of view, everything that happens in Portland is best in the Every well, single okay. case Nick goes on. And that's another reason why I didn't like this storyline, because I thought that's what they were driving yeah. for at first, and then it turned out to be the ghost of Jack the Ripper <laughs> inside Sean, who is partly Vesson. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so I was like, uh... No, that was lame. That failed for me, but I, I liked everything think, else. I also feel like uh, in this day and age, his DNA was nowhere. Like he's not a suspect at all. Like I know how they wrapped it up, but I just maybe I've watched too many TV shows that show the technology of catching and tracking DNA. But I feel like there should have been more consequences for Sean Renard being a part of the police force and being at all these murders. But was it his DNA that they were finding, or was it the ghost of Jack the Ripper DNA? Do ghosts sleep DNA? Or, but in they, the room, they did they even find <laughs> DNA? I don't think they did. I don't think they I found think anything. I, right, there but was I very feel little like... forensic evidence. But they stuff. also they did a cover up too, so they wouldn't ever point it back to Sean. Point of fact: Here's another <laughs> thing about Grimm, generally speaking. So remember how I said I don't really love procedurals? Well, it's because procedurals follow the same formula episode after episode after episode. There are rules that they set up. This is how we solve crimes. And then a crime happens. And then they use those rules to solve the crime. And if you like that kind of TV, you like to follow the rules and see if you can solve the crime. Well, Grimm doesn't really do that. (laughs) The rules change. (laughs) So it's like, you know, and I I buy it when it's Vesson. But then when they do present the intriguing, like, oh, hey, a human is mixed in this. And then it turns out to not be. It just was very anticlimactic. Mm-hmm. But, you know, good for the actor. He did a good job. <laughs> so that's season four? That's season four. Is there anything else you wish to say about season four before we move on? Yeah. It's one of the better ones of the show overall. Mm-hmm. I agree. But I think the best one is the one we're about to talk about. Yay, yes. season five. So in season five, the best way to summarize season five, as I said in the talking points, is Black Claw versus Hadrian's Wall or How the Grim Strikes Back. Yes, I went Star Wars for that. We can do all the nerd things. So we're at, equal opportunity nerdists. <laughs> yes! Sure. And that's probably copywritten by the nerdist, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, nerdists, like, as a group, oh, we are. Girl. Yes. Not or the nerdists. Nerdologists. 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 <laughs> I like that better. Copyright TM. Registered. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, continue. So at the end of season four, you know, we think that Trouble has killed Juliet. Kelly Burkhardt is dead and decapitated. With her head in a box. With her head in a box, which disappears. disappears. Mm -hmm. Because Chavez takes it. Chavez, yep, Chavez and her crew clean up the crime scene at Nick's house. So the head goes missing, Juliet's body is taken, and Trouble goes with her. Yes. In the meantime, Adeline is really, really pregnant. And... There is a question that Nick must face, and that's kind of how the season starts, about what does he do about her and this baby? Does he father this child? Does he take responsibility for it? And in the meantime, you know, Juliet, who he was estranged from because, you know, she was kind of a bitch at this point, being a hex and beast and all, he still has lingering feelings for her. 
What did you think about season five overall? What did you like? What didn't you like? And then by all means, now all the things you've been wanting to say all along, say them now because we're at that season. Well, I forgot them. No. <laughs> Jen <laughs> Likely Story. I'll, Jen says this is her favorite show. I don't buy it. It is. I mean, I buy that it's your favorite show. I just don't buy that you forgot anything. <laughs> <laughs> I struggled a little bit at the beginning because it they kind of changed it a lot like it wasn't the grim we were used to well it wasn't no trailer nick packed up and left the house he sold the house he sold the house and set up a secret bunker in the warehouse district Mm -hmm. that only him and adeline and then hank gradually the scooby gang knew about yeah and that they could access but there was all yeah so he has this bunker now Mm -hmm. so all the locations have changed yes they still have the spice shop. They still have the spice shop, and they still have Monroe and Rosalie's, but and the nobody knows. Precinct. Yeah, but nobody knows where Nick lives. Right. Because all these different people, Chavez is part of one organization, which we find out is Hadrian's Wall. We'll set that up. In the meantime, Vessin on Vessin violence is getting pretty big, and we find out about this symbol, which is four black scratch marks on things, which we find out is called Black Claw. Yes, Nick, who's not Burkhart. We did not <laughs> talk about Monroe's basically racist parents, but that's fine. Oh, that's we right. hinted at it yeah. because of the whole, you know, interspecies commingling. But yeah, Monroe's racist parents. One of them is Elliot's mom from ET, D. Wallace mm-hmm. Stone. Yeah, so they were really hard on the only blue button, Mary blue button thing. Yeah, it was mm-hmm. hard to like them at all. Really. Yeah. yeah. Well, Since because they already they're... made the KKK connection. <laughs> <laughs> Had the election started by then? I don't remember. I don't think so. Okay. Well, there's other things that make me think, and this season was inspired by real life events. We'll get to that, I guess. But talk about season five, or I'll start because I know how I feel. Go on. I'll start. Before <laughs> we get to see how powerful. Season... What? Diana is. Oh, hell yeah. And she's grown up all of a sudden. Yeah, Yeah, she like... Somebody (laughs) explain how she looks like she's eight years old. She's a magical... She's a magical baby. baby. It's like... It's like... What's her face on Supernatural that... When she came, the darkness oh, came yeah. back. And no, Amara. It's Amara. <laughs> she, Amara. She grew up very quickly. She did, but she was, you know, the weird darkness. Whereas, well, this, this is, one's a weird something. <laughs> <laughs> She's she is definitely powerful. weird. But she even, weird. but even when Diana came back and Adeline saw her for the first time in this season, she was, she was like, "Whoa, yeah, you, you yeah, yeah." She was, was shocked. shocked. So shocked. there was some magicalness with that. I wonder if they'll explain that. I hope they do. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I doubt they will. I think they it feel like they've explained it enough in that there's we don't know anything about her, so that's I, why she's also growing fast. Because. Well, I disagree with you. I think they are going to explain it because my prediction, and we can sort of dovetail predictions in this conversation, is that Diana is the big bad of season six. I agree with that. I think that she probably will be as well, but I think they might still leave at it at because of... Adelaide went through this process that gave, while she was pregnant with her, that gave her these powers. It also gave her accelerated growth. Like, I think that's all there is to it. Okay. I don't have faith in the writers, I guess. Oh! (laughs) That's sad. Well, I'm going to say that season five is my favorite of the five seasons, hands down. Agreed. Yes. Because, and Kristen kind of mentioned it earlier. I guess the writers made a concerted effort to get back to the whole Grimm mythology, and I feel like they really did. Mm -hmm. And one of the key ways they did that was to reintroduce the keys. So all along through the series, (laughs) and it started with Kelly Burkhart, I Mm -hmm. think, there was this introduction of the Grimm keys, these magical Grimm keys. There are seven of them. We didn't know where they all were. But but they had map. They were They made made a map. map. The royals really wanted them. That was one of their key... Ames was to get these keys, and Nick had amassed three of them by the beginning of the season, and, you know, they kind of left the keys behind for a while. They hadn't talked about them at all during season four. Mm -hmm. I know there might be some disagreement, but I was particularly intrigued by the Nick and Adeline baby, because I wanted to know what this baby was going to be. You know, is the baby grim? Is the baby hex and bees? Is the baby some combination thereof? The baby, by the way, is a boy. And they name him Kelly after Nick's mom. Adeline names him Kelly. Adeline does. Mm-hmm. Because Adeline, 
when she starts the season, she she has taken as of season four a suppressant that quells her hex and beast abilities. Mm -hmm. And whenever those are in dormancy, I guess if you want to say it, she's really nice. She mm -hmm. is. She's not a totally bad human yeah, right. being. And they actually set up a little home life in this bunker and play house and fall in love with each other. She, Nick. <laughs> she names one kid after her mom, and then she names another kid after the person who killed her mom. That's weird. That is yeah, but it's, but it's, it's Nick's sure. mother, and it's a way, because she knows that he's hurting. I know, it's still weird. I know. That's how but I think it's. But I thought it was very sweet that she named the boy Kelly. I thought it was a gesture. Yes, and she was trying to bridge that divide mm -hmm. because Adeline has gone. I think of all the characters, she's had the biggest character arc mm -hmm. in terms of change and yeah, evolution. she's progressed. I think mm -hmm. the close second is Julia. Yeah, well, for sure. Well, yeah, we'll get to that. We'll get to that. <laughs> That's kind of like to say. We'll yes. get to that. But season five, just it was it was packed. It was tense a lot of the time. It was really exciting. There was a lot of stuff happening. Everybody was working together. There were a couple of one-off Monster of the Week episodes that did literally almost put me to sleep. But for the most part, it was really, really exciting. And I loved how they kind of stirred all the different things that they had mentioned in previous seasons back into it and made it kind of a really good setup season for the final one. I don't really remember the monsters in that I mean, other than who was in Black Claw and all that. To me, that was the whole season. Was So some of the isolated monster stories, we had the Lost Boys, so that was clearly a Peter Pan oh, ripoff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They kidnapped Rosalie Lee, because they wanted to make her their mother. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. The little girl, by the way, was named Lily, not Wendy, but Lily Darling is the name of Michael and John and Wendy's mother. So they do that one. There is the weird marriage quest with the three suitors and the mob. They're a particular kind of vestin that observes this really ancient ritual. Mm -hmm. And they kind of get mixed up in the mob and they all die and that happens. The Rat King, the oh, really yeah, disgusting yeah. That episode. Yeah, yeah. That, that, that was a little gross really, factor with that was me. weird. <laughs> Yeah. There was the lake monster that again reminded me of an X-Files episode, only this time it was a Vessin, and the two Vessin that run the little gift shop basically trying yes. to merchandise it. Yep. <laughs> oh, yeah, the one that was exploding yeah. yep. it. There was the Vessin, the farming Vessin, who sacrificed seven other Vessin to make rain. There was the Lucador, <laughs> who is a Mexican wrestler with the masks, oh, and he mm -hmm. had a real Vessin yeah. mask. There was, this was also a high gross factor one, and one of the ones that put me to sleep. The beauty sucking monster, so the really beautiful, he's a photographer, he sucks out their essence of youth and beauty, and then there was that doctor who used this serum and put it all over his face. Oh, yeah. yeah. I which totally also feels yeah, yeah. like a couple of X-Files episodes yeah. mixed mm -hmm. together, but yeah. whatever, yeah. that's probably yeah. why it put me to sleep. And then... Because the X-Files was better, I mean. And then there was also the devil one where Ethan, William Mapather from Lost, he played Ethan on Lost. He was a devil who ran an evangelist's tent. Oh, yeah. And then the Inuga Inugami, the Japanese honor vessin with the two boys that accidentally shot a third boy who was a vessin. And also the vulture vessin that sucks bones from near-dying people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Those are all the... Oh, yeah, because that was to, to keep his parents alive. Yes, yeah. that one was gross, too. There was a lot of gross ones this yeah. season. But I would agree with you, the mythology was far more memorable. Yeah. But I did just watch this season, and mostly over the last few days. <laughs> so those, like, all stick out. I do wonder the X-Files comparison, because it switched for me in the rewatchability of this, if it will ever switch over. Because I was all X-Files, the mythology, and then... After rewatching it, the monsters of the week are the reasons to rewatch it, and for for me. So I wonder if that will switch because right now it's the mythology. Basically, it has been for the seasons three, and four, and five. I don't know. I don't Jen know watched it. What do you think? Oh, oh, what? I'm sorry. Do you feel that there will come a time when rewatching it, you're going to like the monsters of the week more than the mythology, or think they are more rewatchable, like in the case of the X Files with Nick? I think so. I mean, just from rewatching seasons, I, now I want to go back and watch one through, well, eventually when six is done, watch all of them, but 
just watching three, four, and five over again, which I didn't really rewatch five. I did half of it, the first half, and then the last two episodes. But I really enjoyed, especially three, more than I did the first time. So I mean, if I, I, I do want to watch them again, I think that I will enjoy them even more. The monster specific, you know. Okay. I don't know that it'll ever get to the point where it'll be more than what's happening with Nick and Juliet and you know all of the gang. My feedback on this is that the X Files Monsters of the Week episodes are quite memorable. Like there are some ones that stick out and are even if you don't love the show, like that's one of that is my favorite or one of my favorite shows. I go back and forth, but it's in the top three easy. Those episodes, there are some that even if you aren't a super fan, you remember them. You know, like postmodern Prometheus being one, or Home being another, or Home. I remember that. Yeah, and I'm not a big fan of X Files. I've watched it a lot. I have not watched all of the shows, but yeah, yeah, that's one of them I remember. You're right about that. And you even know it by title. Like yeah. I told you, Home, mm-hmm. and you know exactly what I'm talking about. Yeah. I don't think that would happen for Grimm because no, a lot of it is yeah, repetitive, and yeah. it's you know, a murder happens. They go look. Oh, it's Vesson. Grimm confronts them. Yeah. Vesson says, Grim! Vesson, Grim fight, they solve the murder, it's done. There's no Mulder Scully dynamic in Grim either. There is yeah. none. No. But I do have to say, I think that the rewatchability of those mythologies in X Files, I think there's more questions for me. Whereas I think Grim answers think, questions. Yeah, I think they are actually doing that better than X Files did. I think the mythology of Grim is far more appealing, which is why back to season five, <laughs> this one is so good because they finally gave us, I think there's still more to it because we don't exactly know what the artifact is. Want me to set it up? Go ahead. like to hear it. Here it goes. So the, what happens is Monroe has an Uncle Felix who is an appraiser in Germany. A contact of his alerts him to basically a Grimm. They find out later he's a Grimm a very old one, has passed away. He has this chest that is full of books. And Monroe's uncle Felix appraises books. He realizes that these volumes are old grim texts. Very old, very ancient. One of them is a registry of all the Grimm family tree going back to the Knights Templar and possibly earlier. We don't know. We don't know how far it goes. So they contact... The uncle contacts Monroe, Monroe contacts Nick. They see it as an opportunity to replace some of what is lost from Aunt Marie's trailer. They get a hold of these books and this chest, and as Monroe is kind of, because he's the clock worker, he repairs and makes clocks, he's kind of tinkering around with this chest. He realizes that inside the bolt on the chest is hidden two of the grim keys. So that makes their grand total five. They start to put it together. This is kind of the big mid-season arc. They they put it together. They don't have the whole map, but through logic and what they know of history, including what's happened in Europe and the Crusades, because the Knights Templar fought in the Crusades. That's where they come from. They figure out that the missing treasure that these keys lead to is somewhere in the Black Forest in Germany. They narrow it down to a church. Nick and Monroe go over to Germany to look for it, and they find this church. It's nothing but a foundation. It's buried in the countryside. They land in the catacombs. Of course, they encounter a local Vesson who realize he's a Grim, including a priest, which I thought was very, very interesting. But they fall in the catacombs, and there's this cool Da Vinci Code-like thing where they have to turn off the lights and stuff glows. And they find the chest, and even though they don't have all seven keys, between Monroe's lock-picking mechanism and Nick's strength, they're able to open the chest. And inside the chest is a very, very old piece of papyrus or cloth parchment that has Aramaic on it, and there, which is language of old, Jesus. Yeah, the language of Jesus. And inside is a stick, basically. But this stick, <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> let down like yeah. Well, well, that's how, and they play. Everybody plays that really well. It's a stick. All of this for a stick. Mm-hmm. But no, this stick is is kind of must be divine in origin. We don't know. There's words on the parchment that say it's miraculous. It's Latin or Hebrew. I don't remember. (laughs) Rosalie is able to translate the bits and pieces that they find. Yeah, and it's one says miracles and one says dangerous or perilous or or whatever. 
what we do know, because Monroe gets attacked by the local vessel in Europe and he gets bitten, and this turns into blood poisoning, and we think he's going to, like, you know, bite it. But this stick heals him, it brings him back from the fold. And it's only Nick seems to be able to use it so far. I don't think Trouble's touched He's it. He's the only one that's touched it, right? Well, it's Trouble every... handles it, but there's nobody around. But, like, like... Monroe and all of them, Besson, they're, like, afraid to touch it because they don't Well, doesn't, it. doesn't Nick Monroe it. touch it and that's how he gets healed? Doesn't he grab onto it? No, Nick's no. holding it. Nick, oh, Nick's, Nick's holding it and then he touches... Nick's holding the stick and then he... Yeah. He touches... Monroe. Monroe. Yeah. In fact, whenever it works, it's when he's It's when Nick's holding it. it. It's holding it. Which raises a very important question, which I hope they answer. Is it a grim weapon, or is it just a Nick weapon? Why would it just be? Maybe he's chosen by God. Or maybe it's his family bloodline that's tied to it somehow. Maybe they're the king of the Grims. And is the only thing it does heal? Can it do something else? Which is a right. very good question. question. If it can give life, does can it, it take, take life? life? Well, There's yeah. probably a balance aspect yeah. to it. So intrigued by this, mm -hmm. and I think this is it's the, the 100th payoff. episode too, right? What when I find it is the 100th episode. It was the 100th. Oh, yeah, when they like, yeah the whole Black Forest thing mm -hmm. was to was. celebrate that milestone. It is a. I really enjoyed that episode. I think mm -hmm. if I was a cast member on the show, I'd be like, the 100th episode is just Nick and Monroe. Okay. Well, they, but, yeah, yeah, everybody, everybody was, was in it. Sure was yeah, in it. Everybody was in it. But yeah, I, there was it was it split time. No, it, the, those two because it was a it, it was a two parter. It, it, it was a two parter, it, 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 and it split time. So yeah. half of it was Nick and Monroe. Half of it was everybody, everybody else. else. Yeah. It seemed like Nick and Monroe got whatever. It's about their death. Those well, and when the show the started, it was season thing. one, wasn't it? It was, yeah. And Monroe, and Monroe yeah. really. A little bit. Yeah. I liked it as a viewer. Yeah. I loved it. I, I loved it. Two, my two most favorite episodes mm -hmm. in the entire series yep. were those two episodes. The last two? The Black Forest. The Black, the oh, Black Forest. Yep. Ones. Agreed. Not, not necessarily. I mean, I loved the finale, but if I were to pick favorites of the whole series, it would be those two. It was awesome. What else did you think about season five? What do you think about Eve? Yeah, Juliet's reveal. Oh, oh so I was... Yeah, all no, the different let's, colors. Let's so, like, different. <laughs> so in fact, Juliet's not dead. This government agency is not... It's sort of government. It's government black ops, but they call themselves Hadrian's Wall. It's like the resistance, but legitimate. They have money and resources. They've recruited Trouble. She's like their grim on staff. Meisner is like the local head of the whole thing. Meisner that we last saw in season three. And then Juliet is their hex and beast on staff. Mm -hmm. But in order for her to be, you know, useful, because she was all out of control at the end of season four, she's created, or maybe they've created for her through brainwashing, that's not entirely clear, a completely dissociative personality. Juliet, she says, Juliet is dead. She is Eve. Yeah, they essentially, they, they, they didn't care for that? No. I didn't care for the storyline with her. Mm -hmm. Why? Because if she was going to work to oh, help man. to go his hands. against <laughs> Bad Vessin, I guess I would have rather her have been working with Nick if they were going to come up with this whole conflated story. It just, every time I saw her, it just was annoying to me. I, with the wig, that is well, <laughs> well, the wigs were stupid. The wigs were stupid. stupid. But the reason that they do it is because, you know, the whole her friends still other she may still have family in Portland, and so it's a way of them not recognizing her when she's out and about. That's why she has to go incognito to the little bit that she does, is so nobody recognizes her because Juliet, to the world, is dead. She's a lot more powerful in season five, and once she gets her powers under control and learns them. I mean, she starts doing things that she didn't, obviously, in four. She's definitely very powerful. I mean, she took out all of, in, was that in season five? With the, yeah, the yeah. when she came back. With the, in the warehouse where she takes mm -hmm. out like 20 of the those bad Vessen black cops. That's actually at the North Precinct, the one that's controlled by all the Vessen. Mm -hmm. She comes in. Yeah, and who's, she, yeah. who's the man? The big bad that we think is the big bad, the head of Black Claw. So Black, it's Hadrian's Wall. So we have this kind of legitimate arm of the resistance called Hadrian's Wall. But then we have now I don't know is Black Claw related to the Royals? It's basically I think so. Vesson who believe that Vesson should live as Vesson will without having to hide. 
and they have this Latin phrase that I cannot reproduce for you right now. It's all about being free, and it's Black Claw versus Hadrian's Wall, and with this particular thing that we're talking about. Because Black Claw, first they are after Vesson, who sympathize with humans. Then they go after Nick, because he's a Grim, and Adeline, because she's pregnant by a Grim. And then they have this piece of it. Well, the head of Black Claw is this guy named Bonaparte. That's his last name. I don't remember his first name. And I wonder if he's related to Napoleon. But he is a Zobber Beast. Full-blooded he's Zobber like Beasts that. are rare. That's what they the show has mentioned that a couple of times. And he is all sorts of powerful, too. Yeah, he's real powerful. Mm -hmm. There's a whole bunch of stuff that happens in this season, but eventually, well, we should also mention this, which we didn't mention, which we've been hinting at. So there's this huge conspiracy. There's The mayoral election is mm -hmm. happening in oh, Portland. Yes. And there is a conservative <laughs> candidate and a liberal candidate. I don't know who is which. It's very confusing. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Is Sean Renard's poster very Hope-esque, Obama Hope-esque, I feel like? Yes. That's yes. what I think is okay. happening. Yes. What we find out is Black Claw has created this conspiracy to assassinate the liberal candidate, we think. Sure. Sure. <laughs> First, they try to convince Sean to endorse a political candidate, which he does. He's very reluctant. He says, I've he endorses, never done that. He endorses the one that they... Shoot. Yes. And then they position him to, to take over him. the candidacy, and he gets elected mayor. And as part of this process, he gets in bed with Black Claw. So whether he truly believes it or not, that's a question. But he's in bed with this organization. And a member of. And a member of. And a member yep. of. Well, it has to be if he's going to be their mayor, I guess. Mm -hmm. They also strong-arm Adeline into leaving Nick because they have Diana. They get Diana back. They lure Sean in, that's partly how they lure Sean mm -hmm. in is Diana. Then Sean lures Adeline in because Adeline's been trying to get back with Diana. Diana. But then she also takes Kelly and leaves Nick. Mm -hmm. And there is his ready-made political family. So this is all happening, <laughs> dovetailed to at some point when he gets elected mayor, the Vesson and Black Claw thing gets free run of Portland. There's this precinct in the north. They're all Vesson. They... Nick is really angry. He starts to try to take out Sean. Sean's like, arrest him. They do. He ends up in a cell. Bonaparte's like, I want to meet with Nick. Sean's like, okay. And so the North Precinct Vesson people end up holding him captive while Bonaparte tries to... What they want is the Grimm book. The book that has all of the Grimm family history in it. That's the whole purpose yep. of it. So they can kill all the Grimm. Yeah. So they can kill all the Grimm. And Juliet and Trouble and Hank and Wu all end up in this precinct. And Juliet, almost single-handedly, takes, takes out all the people. And then gets into this epic battle, possibly more epic than the one with Adeline, with this Bonaparte guy. Mm -hmm. He almost kills her. He makes glass magically fly and stab her. So Nick tries to heal her, takes her back to the bunker and tries to heal her with the magical Grimm stick. And then the Zobber Beast, Bonaparte, goes back, tortures Adeline into betraying the location, but Diana has her last word in that situation. And she, doesn't she kill Bonaparte? She, she voodoos her dad to do it. Yeah. Yep. She uses her dolls. Yes. Her doll. <laughs> Which was set up earlier in the season. That's one of Because she does not like Rachel, who is the name of the PR for the one candidate who gets dead, and then mm -hmm. as PR for Renard, is also his mistress. And... When her parents get back together, she's very excited by this and very threatened by anything that would endanger that. Well, they weren't even really together. They were pretending. Adeline's pretending to be with Sean well, yes. while he's actually with the PR woman. But, and then, but Diana doesn't know that. No, and when Diana finds out, she kills the PR woman with her magic. With yes. her own sheets. Yeah, her she, own sheets. Her own sheets. Yeah, strangled. She's, yeah, she, well, she suffocates her, the, the whole, whole nine yards, and... And then she tries to voodoo Adeline and Sean to start making out and try to make them pretend like they're in love again. And they figure out, oh, wait, this is our daughter that's doing this to us. She's kind of crazy. So much. <laughs> isn't it? Mm -hmm. Even when I wrote the talking points, that one talking point about what happened at the end of the season was not a point, it was a paragraph. It was an yeah. essay. It's like, this all happened in the last two episodes. So my question is, 
Juliet did not die, though, when she got the shard of glass in her. She has not died yet. I don't know what's happening. So Nick tries to heal her with right, the healing right. stick. And she seems to be okay, except for that ironclad psyche that she kind of, you know, erected to keep Juliet out of the Eve brain. Right. Juliet's popping back through now, mm -hmm. yeah. somehow. I but thought she, she had I don't died, think, I don't and then he brought her back to life, but maybe no, not. No, she never, she never, she never she, died. She's not oh, died, so but died. I don't think she's okay. out of the woods yet. Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah I don't she so seems so. to be still hurt. Mm -hmm. And they seem to imply that it didn't work the way it was supposed to work. So, yeah. so if it healed anything, it's probably healing the mental divide, not the physical. I wonder divide. if it's because she's a hex and beast. That's a good question. Mm -hmm. Because, mm -hmm. and because she's a different hex and beast, and she's a different kind of hex and beast. Yeah, yeah. Like, or yeah, or maybe it is because she's not a natural vessel. Maybe it is curing the vessel part. Yeah, oh. and taking away her powers, which would be sad. Yeah. She's yeah. kind of ba, and I think a war is coming. That's my prediction. Yeah. A big war, not just one of these little wars. But who's heading it up? Because. Oh, the Royals is dead. The I think it's the Royals. It's be the Royals. It has to be. Who well, could be Pat bigger than Black Claw? Dead, so, the what, what are the Royals? Like, then they all die. <laughs> Did all the Royals die? I, no, not everybody. Nick killed Kenneth. Wasn't Nick that killed Kenneth? Oh, Victor? Did Victor die? Oh, where that's is right. Victor? We don't know where he yeah. went. We don't right. know where <laughs> Victor is, and maybe the Royals are like hydrogen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You cut off one head and another Three one comes back. up. Yeah. I hope they explain that in season six. Like, I hope they... They've got a lot to explain it to do. In they the do. 13 episodes. They do have to explain a lot. Yeah. But I do think it's the royals because they're they're the ones that throughout all of the seasons... They always come back. They always come back. And, and it's always about world domination and killing the great. Well, and I don't think we said what happened to... What's the word you say before wall? Adrian's, Adrian's wall. wall. That's... Yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah. No they came in and that. destroyed it. The royals or Black Claw or whoever. When because they, they distracted the Nick, or not Nick, they distracted the Hadrian's Wall people by kidnapping Hank with this North Precinct people, the vessel yeah. and cops. And while everybody was out of the Hadrian's Wall HQ, they went in and destroyed everything. I thought the royals wanted to hide the vessel, like they didn't talk about it. Like they were trying to keep that from coming out. So I, why would they start? Well, war? who's running Black Claw then? I That's don't think the it's question. the royals because they're all about Vessen is going to dominate. Like they're going to take over the world. I mean, the but king's the Black dead. Hill, they want the Vessen to take over the world too, but they just want to do it in, in a, a more quiet, way. free. No, they want to do it in a more public way. way. In a public way. The royals? Like that? No, 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 Black Claw. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. But the royals, there's enough we don't know about them. And now the king's dead, so whoever is... The prince. Maybe this is maybe his views. That could be. Whatever that prince. Be. Maybe and maybe they're setting up Sean to be that prince. Yeah, that could be. Because Which I have to say, this is. is the season I start to dislike that character. Sean. <laughs> a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. yeah. he's chosen a side, and it's not the side that I like. <laughs> yeah. Well, the question is... It's Why does he side. choose that side? I think he wanted to be mayor, legitimately. I think he is yeah. how it started, and he just—it was a slippery slope to power. I, but also, I think he wanted his slope. daughter back. Well, that's the—that was the entry point. But at yeah. some point, it was like, okay, are you really buying into this, or are you just putting on an act? That was just—I was just going to say, or is it an act yeah. that he knows that he can't do anything on the, the outside? He has to be on the kill. outside. So maybe, yeah, he'll. I think he's going to get inside. deeper and deeper into the bad side. The organization. The end of season six will be him flipping the switch. Well, that'll be oh, disappointing. That and then Netflix will pick <laughs> it up. Nope. I don't think Netflix will pick it up. No, I think I they're, think, no. they're going to end it and they're gonna it's going to be it. done. I think the producers are ready to end it. They've been pretty... I'm not ready for it to I'm be I'm sorry, Jen. <laughs> but... Not everything can last 12, 13 seasons. I, I know, right? Supernatural. <laughs> yeah, at least Netflix. Netflix. Six is pretty good. <laughs> yeah. Six is very good for it being a Friday night cult show. Well, yeah. they, yeah. well, they've also moved it around to so many different time slots since it first premiered. Yeah, but it's always been on a Friday. Mm -mm. No, it hasn't. No. Only was it recently. like a Tuesday or something? It was like a, I think it was Thursday? like a Sunday or a Tuesday. Oh, maybe it was a Sunday. They moved the once they moved it to Friday. It, was it wasn't Tuesday. Friday. I know that. They but they also like one time it premiered like in August. That's true. They've yeah, they've that shifted happened. it. They've I mean, but they've moved it to Friday. It's been Friday. A couple a seasons, while. but usually that's the the death one. When you get moved to a Friday, Friday. night, you, they're trying to kill it. But they found that it actually works really well on a Friday night with its audience. 
people who like it don't go out. Or, <laughs> or <laughs> it's just, just, I don't know. I just think they have a loyal fan base. Yeah, I think they it's do. a very, kind of like the Supernatural fan base, very voracious, growing cult. It's not just an isolated one. More people discover the show. It is available on Amazon for yep. people to mm-hmm. watch it. That's what I was going to say. I don't know how many people are watching and it's picking up steam that aren't, like, the time slot doesn't matter because that they're not watching it when it's airing. Mm-hmm. But they're keeping up with it. Well, and I do think it's I always am. had a lot of streaming traffic. Yeah, even, like, Hulu. you know, DVRs and all that, you know, the seven-day numbers are good. Well, that, but also Hulu up until, uh, and maybe still this season, but at least for a long time, NBC allowed Hulu to have the whole season and not just part of it. I think they do have the whole season. So still. I think people can catch up that way, too. And you can measure stuff. And Hulu has advertisers, so they can do that whole thing, too. And I was just, because I had no idea when this was coming back, looking at the NBC app. And it has nothing for Grimm right now. Like, it doesn't have the last five episodes or anything, which it no, does it on its website. Has the or it did it on its website. Episode one of season six. Mm-hmm. Wait it out. Like usually, you want people to be able to catch up on the cliffhanger before you go into it. Well, maybe they're hoping you'll take a Prime subscription because all of season mm-hmm. five is on Prime. Yeah, but That's they also do. You know, previously on Grimm, they have. Yeah, they do. It's not good wrap enough for me. Wrap it up pretty good in the beginning. So we should mention a couple of things about season five before I ask you a couple of these ending questions. In the season finale. Well, we've already mentioned that, you know, Juliet nearly dies. Nick is attacked. He stays behind. There's these underground tunnels underneath this lot that's kind of like been this thing the whole season. Which I never got. No, no <laughs> one cared because they never went anywhere. They never wanted to well, go Well, I didn't get why this factory had underground tunnels. Like, I didn't just took either. over a fa- But there's going to be something grim related. It was something with prohibition, they said. Yeah, yeah but, but it was But why would there be something little... hidden there that would be pertinent to Grimm? There wasn't. I I just think they were trying to set it up so they'd have somewhere to go in the finale, basically. Mm -hmm. It gave them a safe haven. (laughs) There was a safe haven. So they wouldn't get killed. And that's what happened. You know, they all end up back at the bunker. They're trying to figure out what to do. Vessen are descending, Black Claw Vessen are descending upon it. They know where he lives because Adeline was tortured to betray the location. Nick buys time by telling everybody to get into the tunnels and go ahead of him. Trouble is very vexed by this. And he's able to stave all of them off because he has the healing stick. Because he does get shot at one point. But he has the healing stick in his pocket and he's okay. Doesn't seem to be flinching. And then, of course, he meets Bonaparte. Diana voodoo's him. And then the very end of the season, we get two major things. First is Sean staring Nick down like he's going to kill him. And second is, Rosalie is pregnant by Monroe. What's yeah, that going to be? Yeah, <laughs> like a blue bot, a fuchs bow, a combination. And what is a combination? Mm-hmm. A blue bow, a fuchs bot. <laughs> I like that one. I don't know. Or is it the <laughs> whole, or is it just, it's going to be one or the other, like or with normal other, yeah. genes, yeah. Which we also haven't it. mentioned that Wu was oh, yeah, scratched yeah, yeah. by a lycanthrope, oh, which is really yeah, bad. He's, he's, a werewolf. he's a werewolf. A that, no, he does not. He looks not, like a caveman, yeah. doesn't he? Yeah. Yeah. That was like and a weird like, thing. It's so yeah. weird. It's he's like, like super strong. strong. I like, don't understand what's going on I don't here. either. Especially since they make a point of saying lycanthropes are vested and vested are born. I don't get it He at looks all. nothing like Mm-mm. a blue yeah, a like throat, whatever, which is was really different than a yeah. Yeah. yeah, he is bizarre. Know. I didn't mind that storyline, <laughs> but I don't know. I don't understand it. I don't understand it either. Like I think they should have cured him of that. I think it should have. But they said there is no episode. cure. I they should have. Do you think they'll find a cure? I don't. I think they should. <laughs> they should find a cure. <laughs> yeah, because right now, yeah, Hank is I the only one hundred percent human yeah. member of the Scooby Gang. It's like the Vampire Diaries. I just don't like him. Like, like, the, uh, no. I don't like him not having control of it. I yeah. would have, I guess, liked yeah. it better if he he was just vested now, even though I guess that wouldn't make sense. I think the woo thing is unnecessary. Yeah. Because you already have so much going on, it just seems like a distraction when it happens. At least, mm-hmm. uh, yeah. It made it easier for him to give them more time to escape once, I feel like. Yes, yeah. I agree once. With that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, and he'll, have, he'll be able to do more if there's some sort of epic battle trying to take over Hogwarts. <laughs> That's what it feels like. Yeah. Who's Hogwarts? I don't know. Portland. What's Hogwarts? Portland. 
Hogwarts really? is Portland. I mean, Hogwarts. really. I mean, I do kind of want to visit Portland, but I want to visit Hogwarts more. It does make me feel like, especially with Rosalie and Monroe having a baby, I get a, like, Tonks Lupin vibe, and I fear that they won't survive the last season. I think mm. you're not wrong on this one. <laughs> so where, where, where can they go from here? What are your predictions for season six? I do think they could play with the timeline. It's only three, 13 mm-hmm. episodes, but it could jump time, and we can see Nick's child get older and become a grim, potentially. We can see farther down the line. As an they, epilogue, or just over the course of the season? I think it could be over the course of the season, or it could just be an epilogue. I think it could epilogue. be a last episode. There's some unpredictability, because we they know we know. We all know it's ending. So they can do just about anything. What do you want them to do? I don't know. I feel I don't know. I feel like Nick and Juliet are gonna be fine and live happily ever after. Or is he gonna live happily ever after with Adeline? Because no. that's yeah, still I, that's 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 I don't know. I don't I don't want him to end up with Adeline. I don't either. I'm anxious to see what happens with Juliet and her Hex and Beast and is that does it stay? Is it get more powerful, less powerful? Like what and Diana. Like what's gonna happen with her? I think that my like, prediction is, she gonna is be she's called the villain. Rowan when we see her in the beginning, you know, like the beginning part of the season, is she gonna be like an adult or something? Because she grew up so fast in season four or five. She could. They could they like, like I said, they can go four to five, we yeah. can have a couple episodes and then a year can go by and have a couple more and see because of the finality we can see, like, Portland in complete, like, destroyed, and them fighting. So you're advocating an apocalypse. I'm not advocating it. I'm saying that it's possible, okay. especially... Kelly the, versus Diana. I think that might Ooh, happen. Yeah, it's possible. Yeah. Wait, yeah, so they would have possible, the time jump yeah. for that. Cause but this is also why I think the royals might come back into the picture, because yeah. they were obsessed with Diana being a weapon. She's turning in to be some kind of force of nature. Mm-hmm. I really think she's going to be the major hurdle they have to climb or mm-hmm. jump over. She's going to be the big bad. She's going to be the big bad. If, and if she's not, yeah. they have. she has to be for part of the season yeah. If to maybe make way for a different one, because if they don't address it, then that's yeah. stupid. So I agree with you there. I think there's also going to be a big war. I feel like there's this... There yeah, that's what be. I'm saying. That's what it feels if they like. Don't, the combination then what's of the, the point of this whole show? Yeah. And then we're, how many? <laughs> how many characters? <laughs> not. I know. But it's like what's I'm and what's so the sad. whole point of this Vesson versus Grimm and the Royal? What what's the point if there's not a big battle for something? Yeah. And are there other Grimms out there besides Nick and Trouble? And are they going to come into the fold? Of well, that? and they should be able to find them if not even if the books aren't the complete, tree. they could go on Ancestry to. <laughs> yeah. Do a little cheek swab and find out your matches. Yeah. Oh, I really want to know about the healing stick. Yeah. Well, I'm really surprised that that's all there was. Was, was that healing stick. stick? I bet there's probably a resurrection stone and an invisibility. So <laughs> if they go back there, it's not an they find something oh. else. <laughs> <laughs> it just heals things. It's not that magical. The elder wand could do all the things. <laughs> so, stop trying to make Harry Potter a thing. It's already a thing. Do you have any other predictions or thoughts or wishes on where they, where you want to see these 13 I episodes I think go? they won't cure Wu and he'll die in the war. Because everybody, loves, gonna everybody loves Wu. So, I mean, they're going to lose one major player. I mean, I know they're probably going to tease it, but I really think we're going to lose at least one of our beloved characters. Wu or Hank would be my guess if they yeah. were going to do that. Yeah. I think it should be the human. I feel like they need to keep a human. There are other humans, presumably, in Portland. We just don't I know. I just meant... I've, I've, <laughs> humans, I've, I've, humans, I've, humans are, are so humans boring. Yeah, humans. Are humans. <laughs> just like down with humans. I think the Juliet-Eve divide is going to come crashing down, and I think it's going to be Juliet in the end. But I think her brain's going to be a melt, because yeah. she's going to have all these different things rolling around in her head. Well, I think, I think something that's going to happen is she's going to start remembering all of her feelings for Nick. I think those are going to come more to the surface and it's going to be an inner battle for I Juliet. think during the big climactic battle, the Ice Beavers will come in and push him over the edge. <laughs> Bud will come in and save the day. Oh, Bud. <laughs> Man, what if Bud dies? Yeah. I would really be sad. Be uh, if Bud dies, I don't think it'll be a climactic one. I think that'll be an early one to really show that it'll, this season yeah. is it. I think we'll lose a cast member. Or two or three. Even or though four. this isn't a Joss Whedon show, that's his thing. I know. I just hope that Nick survives, and I have a feeling it's either going to be 
like you said, Nick and Juliet in the sunset, or Nick and Alan in the sunset, or maybe they have a common, you know, a polyamory thing going on, or he's going to die because he's a Grim. Grim's what if died. Trouble dies? I feel like Adelaide is going to die protecting Juliet. Ooh. Hmm. And Good then, call. then Juliet won't have issues raising Adelaide. Adelaide. Adeline. 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 Her. <laughs> <laughs> or because the baby was conceived when Adeline was Juliet, is it really Juliet's DNA that's in the baby and not Adeline's? <laughs> that's a possibility. They do I'm have their saying. wires crossed magically. They there do. could be some kind of weird genetic intermingling. That would be crazy if yeah. they do that, though. It, you never know. know. Do you have anything else you want to say about season five or your predictions going forward into this final sixth season? I'm kind of. I am sad it's ending. Me too. I am sad it's yeah. ending as but well. But I'm happy it's going on what we hope is going to be a high note, and that they're not just going to let it linger until it dies a slow death in the corner. I think they're going to give us exactly the ending that we need. Because mm-hmm. mm-hmm. the, they, they've they been very adamant about, and the cast has too in the yeah. press, about, you know, this is going to give you closure. A real You know, it's going to be mm-hmm. a real oh, good book good. end. So, yeah. I'm and I think, excited. too, they, they've been prepared. Like, they knew from the network before they started writing, okay, we have, you guys are going to be giving, given 13 episodes. And they were really happy that it was 13 and not 22. But I just, they've had time to prepare, and so I think they're going to plan everything out very strategically. I am surprisingly happy with NBC. Usually they'll, they'll cancel string, you on, string you along <laughs> yeah. or cancel. Like, I'm surprised at how this is turning out, and it's kind of, is the best case scenario for cancellation is to give them those 13 episodes. It is, it's but really I also... It's that they're giving it to them, though. It's weird, but I think that NBC realizes it has a very solid fan base on this show. It must not be that expensive to produce. I mean, it's the same set of visual effects. It's the same locations. It's in Portland. It can't be as expensive as L.A. Ooh, sorry. One thing of the... Somewhere in seasons three through five, the Vogue's got better. They did. Graphically. They did. Like, there was a definite notice to me Oh, oh, oh. Like yeah. they're doing more stuff as they're vogued instead of just seeing it and it going away. I agree. And it's high defing, yeah. voguing, high def <laughs> voguing something. This might be an inane question, but are you going to keep watching? No. Yes. <laughs> that would have been a twist. That would have been really bad. No, I I feel feel that, are you no. telling the truth? No. Okay. I, I probably, as soon as it's up, I will watch season, the next episode. Okay. We can probably. If you guys want to schedule the next podcast for some time after, <laughs> be ready to go. Jen's definitely going to. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's on NBC. It right? is on NBC. On the website. It's true. Yeah. yeah. Would you recommend Grimm to others? Why or why not? I uh, have. Yeah. <laughs> I have too. And I will. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I would. Especially, you know, I think this goes with every show. Not everyone likes every show, but if they're friends of mine and they kind of like X Files or Supernatural, they probably found this show already anyway. But it's true. Yeah, I would say if you like any of the following shows: Buffy, Angel, X Files, Supernatural, even Once Upon a Time, into a sense. Or if you like Harry Potter, as apparently there's many parallels there. Or if you just like fairy tale stories that have a twist. Or if you like the Brothers Grimm, because they are very, very close. That's one of the things I like about this show, because I I mean, I grew up on Disney movies, and I love Disney movies. Mm -hmm. And I love the Disney version of Grimm Fairy Tales, but I also love the Grimm Grimm Fairy Tales. Nick, how are we not related, like, by blood, really? I just, I don't understand that. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you are, and you just I don't know. I haven't done history yet. <laughs> I'm still hoping to be a Grimm. <laughs> yeah, me too. I don't think, I have no German though, so I don't think 50%. it's going to happen. I'm half German. I have a teeny bit. <laughs> Damn it, I'm probably going to be <laughs> Vessen. <laughs> but they're from Germany too, so it's, you know. They're, not they're all from Germany? Germany? Not, Aubrey, not, not all the of them, most ones. of them that we've seen. in. The, but not Aubrey, not all of them. Anything else about Grimm's seasons three, four, five, or what you plan to see in six? Or want to see in six? Or wish to see in six? Or predict to see in six? It's going to be real different from the rest. Yeah, we don't I don't even agree. have the new fortress, I feel like, as... Of solitude? Yeah. yeah. I agree. They probably will make a fortress, though. I was going to say, maybe they'll make a one. Maybe, maybe they they'll just get be on the road. One. Maybe they're going to go to Vienna, and that's where the big showdown's going to happen. Could be. Mm-hmm. That would be new. And expensive. 
Well, they only have to make things look like Vienna. They don't yeah, actually have to go. They don't act. Yeah, they don't. They don't think they've actually shot in Vienna. Right. No. They have some people, but it. I hope season six is the best one. I think it will be, or at least will be on par with five. I'd be okay with that. Yes, five is really good. But I think we've talked ourselves out of Grimm for the time being. Wouldn't you agree? Sure. Yes. And since you do, I would at this time like to thank Kristen, Nick, and Jen for joining me to talk about Grimm seasons three through five. Now, if you've been listening, you know that we have this new little conclusion statement, which I'm going to read because I'm inspired by other podcasts. CPU Exclamation Point was produced by Back Pocket Productions, run by yours truly, the Chief Couch Potato, and hails from Grand Rapids, Michigan. Please, if you like what you hear, take the time to rate us on iTunes, Stitcher Radio, or Google Play. What that means is give us stars. We want on five, you know, but if you're going to not, then at least tell us why not. Or you can comment on YouTube so that we can spread the word more effectively. If you have suggestions on shows you want us to consider talking about that we haven't been talking about, contact us at our website, which is couchpotatoesunite.wordpress.com. You can subscribe to the blog there, or you can send us an email at couchpotatoesunitepodcast at gmail.com. You can also get in touch with us on social media, particularly Facebook and Twitter, though we're adding new and old shows to chat about around the water cooler all the time. As I always say, we have several more new episodes coming down the pike, many of which I listed in the intro, and all of the things that we've been doing and have been talking about are available and searchable via the web. We are literally everywhere, so make sure you subscribe to any of those places, any of our channels, any of our accounts, to stay up on new events and episodes. Until the next time, Grimm can be streamed, as we've mentioned, on Amazon Prime through Season 5. Season 6 premiered on NBC on January 6, 2017. You'll be able to get to that via the NBC website or Hulu. CPU will revisit Grimm with a set of two goodbye episodes after its series finale airs, and that will be sometime after March. So until you hear from us again, either about Grimm or about any of the other shows we discuss, keep listening, keep watching, stay tuned. Bye-bye.